How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, today we're going to have a very interesting discussion. We are going to be talking about maintaining our level of authority. Maintaining our level of authority. So I'll make sure it's spelled correctly because sometimes I get really excited and this computer sometimes does autocorrect and it makes some crazy assumptions. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I, I spell everything correctly before I put it on the screen. Um, guys, this is going to be a great show, guys. I think it's a very important show. Um, I, this, this is really going to be first from a frontline perspective, you know, inwards. How do we, how do we portray confidence? How do we make sure that, you know, we're doing the best we can to be consistent in what we have to do to carry out those orders and get that compliance. But another thing too, that I want to add, the perception of authority also has to be supported from your supervisors to your command staff, your upper echelon. So what can we do there to reinforce our front line to make sure that they continue to have that perception of authority, have that uh, level of authority? And guys, you notice I say perception of authority because the uniform doesn't automatically give that to us. It's how we carry ourselves. So I want you guys to be wary that any time at any moment, we could do something foolish or our supervisors could do something foolish by not supporting us. And then we could lose that perception of authority. So this conversation is going to be great. I got guests on with me. I got Russ Hamilton, David Schillen, Joe Papagno, and Butch Ferrara. Different levels from a lieutenant to sergeant to frontline to woo, deputy commissioner. Uh, so, And then myself, uh, somewhere in the administrative range. Uh, Okay, we're good. All right. Oh, followers are dropping. Here we go. Uh, no, guys. But so we have different perspectives. We'll start with the front line, work our way up. And again, by the way, the cool thing about this, though, is no matter where we were at or where we retired from, all of us have experience where the magic happens at the front line. Now, guys, real quick, let me just introduce our sponsors. My first sponsor is American Military University. If you guys are looking to get a degree, seek higher education, please check out American Military University. It's a great online school, very supportive of what we do in corrections, very supportive of what we do on Tier Talk. So please check it out. We also have Guardian RFID from inmate tracking and cell checks to cloud-based business and artificial intelligence. Guardian RFID digitally transforms jails, prisons, and juvenile detention facilities of every size. Visit guardianrfid.com for more information. Guys, if you get a chance, also check out their YouTube channel. We put content up there as well. And we also have... Thing Gray Line Media, www.thinggraylinemedia.com. We also have David Schilling on the show today as well. Uh, he is the owner of Thing Gray Line Media. Guys, we are working together and we're almost done. We're publishing this book right here, Lessons Learned While Working in a Prison, My Journey from Officer to Administration. And there's the back cover. This book is about 509 pages long. Reason being is there's a passage, but after each passage, you're going to have a spot where you can write your journal. Um, the formatting looks beautiful. Thing Gray Line Media is phenomenal. It's going through some line edits. My friend Sandy Hassan is a beast. I mean, is a beast. Uh, she is making sure it is perfect. So um, I hopefully it still stays on that date of I'm looking to release it. Da, 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 August 15th. That's hopefully going to be the date. Me and David have been working together to try to find out what's the lowest we can go in price. Uh, because don't forget, guys, uh, you have to pay Amazon a certain amount to produce the book. And then they get a royalty as well. And you get the rest. So uh, because it's hardcover, because the book has to be hardcover, because I expect people to be writing inside, opening up the book once in a while. The book's going to be around $45. I think that's where we settle that. I think that's where Amazon gets their share. Uh, and I'm able to make a little something myself. I cannot have the book to be soft cover. It just won't work. It's just, I'm expecting us to open and close it. So I don't think it's going to work if the book uh, is soft cover. I think we're going to get more use. So we need a hardcover book. So first let's bring on our guest. Again, the topic today is about maintaining our perception of authority. There he is. What's up, Russ? Anthony, how are you doing tonight? Good to see you. Right? Hey, Russ, you mind introducing yourself real quick? Not at all. My name is Russ Hamilton. I'm a former and retired sergeant with California Department of Corrections. I'm also a former senior juvenile correctional officer 
and I now work for a private country, uh, country. I wish I was working for a private country, a private company, uh, doing reentry and rehabilitation work at a local probation department and local jail. Russ, that was a Freudian slip and a half. Private country. I, I have dictatorship on my mind. Oh, my God. I just want to give some shout outs to the people in the audience. Jojo, Julie, Dawn Marie. Uh, let's see. Single mom. Uh, Jerry. Uh, yeah, we're getting Jose Valentin uh, says a great topic. And then, of course, we got got Joe is like the, when we get Joe Pompano on, you got to watch this guy. He's in the chats going, hey, baby. Hey, sweetheart. You know, what's up, honey doll? You know what I mean? And and and, and then we had like literally a, a show the other day where it was like Joe Pompano's Angels. This guy is a Mac daddy of, of, of YouTube chat. Actually, you might as well introduce him now. What's up, Joe? <laughs> what, what's going on? Oh, there you well, go. see if I can get my if I can get my mic turned on. Don't hate the player, baby. Hate the game. Yeah, how's it going, you guys? You already have that. Look, look. Let me just show you one of Joe's comments. One of his first comments. Here it is. How you doing? How you there doing? You <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe. You mind introducing yourself? Yes, sir. My name is Joe Pomponio. I'm a I'm retired lieutenant with the Texas Department of Corrections, um, of almost thirty years. And as of right now, still retired from the prison system, but a current panel member with uh, Anthony and the and the rest of the Brady Bunch here on Tear Talk. Right. Hey, and by the way, it's always good having you, Joe. Uh, hey, hey, Russ, real quick, someone asked a quick question. How long did you work for the CDC, the CDCR? Um, I think I was right around uh, 20, 26, 27 years, and then I worked for another couple three years with uh with uh, the juvenile department yeah i just want because someone was asking so guys and then obviously now he's on the rehabilitative side so russ has really gotten a full circle of the correctional system and what's it about so i think that's pretty cool all right so we got also butch ferrara what's up butch how you doing anthony what's going on Doing good, Butch. You mind introducing yourself again? Butch Ferrara, former assistant deputy commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Corrections. I worked in that uh, agency for 35, almost 36 years. Started as a correction officer and uh, moved my way up through the right structure until uh, I was responsible for the northern sector, which was for about eight prisons, including a female site, uh, some minimum security facilities, medium security facilities, and one of Massachusetts' only maximum security prisons. All right. It's, well, hold on. Let me get where to go. It's good seeing you always, Butch. I'm happy. That I think it's the topic that I think you're going to truly definitely have some insight on. So I'm excited to get it going. And we also have my partner now, my my working buddy, David. Sh I call him every day. I call him more than my wife. <laughs> Let's just get that out on the table. Uh, hey, Dave, you mind introducing yourself, please? And can you talk a little bit about your uh, thin, uh, thin gray line media? Ah, yes. My name is Dave Schilling. I uh, live in Rochester, Minnesota. I work for the local sheriff's office here at the jail. Uh, got talking with Anthony over LinkedIn. I uh, needed to know who to find for a book publisher. And I he asked who published my book. I said, well, I did. So off of that conversation, we kind of got going. And next thing I know, I own a publishing company, essentially, because didn't really realize it, but I have all the skills together to publish books and there we go. I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, you're, you're by the way, guys, uh, the work is amazing. I mean, just uh, just the way it's formatted, how beautiful it looks and in the partnership with Sandy Hassan, who is really uh, kind of spot checking uh, everything down to a T. So, as I said, I'm I'm hoping to have this book out by August 15th. Um, but again, I do want it to be perfect for everyone. And, you know, again, it's it's, it's a book that I hope to have a legacy. So. Um, I'm just really happy right now. I mean, really, really happy, but now things are slowing down. I can go back to the routine lives that we were doing. Cause I really missed you guys. And again, I want to do one more shout out to everybody. Uh, Julie, Dawn Marie, uh, single mom, Anika from South Africa. Um, you know, we got the whole crew here, guys, Jojo. Uh, so guys, I really did miss you. Uh, so it's good to be able to come back and get into this dialogue. Now guys, by the way, uh, the main part of the dialogue will be about maintaining our level of authority but we're willing to answer questions along the way, guys. Obviously, this is going to be interactive. So if you have questions, by all means, ask them. 
uh, and we'll go ahead and answer them as they come in. So real quick, guys, I think this is an extremely important topic because obviously in order to be effective at our job, we have to believe in the authority that we're given. And I noticed that some people sometimes are very hesitant with their authority. And what I mean by that is I have seen people give um, orders and when an inmate goes to challenge that order, uh, instead of the um, officer or the staff member reinforcing it from an internal perspective, they'll usually blame the order on, well, my sergeant wanted me to do that. Or that's what policy and procedure says. It kind of becomes like this external justification. You know, in this profession, you're going to have to say no. And the inmates are going to have to, they're going to challenge that no. They're going to ask, why are you saying no? And, and, and your response has to be something internal, something that commits you to the directive. So they know that if they go to challenge the directive, it's a challenge directly of you, not of a sergeant who's not there. Because at the end of the day, when the sergeant doesn't come to work the next day, the inmate's going to ask you the same question again. And guys, this doesn't even just for corrections, but in real life. You know, I mean, if, if, you're, if, if you expect something to be done, even with your kids, the kids got to know that it, it's you. It, it's I'm requesting it. I'm the one giving the directive. But uh, Russ, let's talk about maintaining authority, especially in today's corrections. Do you think there's any difference with the staff members that – where, like, you know, let's say the old school corrections versus the new school corrections when it comes to that perception of authority and how they carry it out. Yeah, I think today, you know, um, what we tend to see is we uh, we tend to see a lot more micromanagement. I think that that micromanagement translates itself into sort of a hesitancy on uh, people to actually step mm -hmm. forward and, you know, uh, take responsibility for their actions. Instead, they're always waiting for someone else to make a decision, someone else to lead. And so uh, this is one of those areas where I've never been a believer in that. I've always thought that um, what you should always do, what you should always know is uh, where your authority stems from and how you fill it out. You know, you take on that whole mantle and you should know everything that there is to know about those powers that you have with regards to, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're sworn in, maybe you're a peace officer. Um, do you know policy and procedure? Do you know what to do in each and every emergency? And so, you know, it's actually filling out and fleshing out that whole mantle of authority that's been vested in you by doing what you had to do to get the job and go through the training and, you know, take on the academy. So this is the way that we actually take it on is by knowing and fulfilling it. Yeah. And, and, and Russ, obviously that's spot on as always, you know, you know what's unique guys, I want people to know something. People may not realize this, but the one thing about working in corrections is your ability to say no is going to be the first thing that's tested. If you come in this profession and you have a problem saying no, you literally will not survive in this profession at all. I mean, that's the first thing that they're going to test you. That's the first thing they're going to want to see that you're committed to. And if at any point you're weak or you're hesitant, or, you know, you're looking to be popular. You know, I, I don't like saying no because, you know, then the inmates are not going to like me. Well, hey, you don't need the inmates' permission to do your job. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to say no. You have to deliver that no with full-on authority. I, I know for a fact, I used to have some supervisors, and I like how they did this, where I would ask them a question if I had to deliver that no. From a distance, they would watch me to see how I delivered it. And they would come back and say, do you feel confident behind that? Because this is what I saw. Now, by the way, this isn't always how you speak it, but your body language when it comes to delivering it. You know, your body language is really what the inmate looks at. They, you, could, you could say no all day, but if your body language speaks the opposite, the inmates can automatically try to see if they could break through that body language. What's your thoughts on, Russ, on, on how no is spoken and how that body language can actually be in conflict with how you feel about that directive. Yeah, you know, at all times, we have to be able to project the authority that we have. Uh, we have to be able to project our own confidence. And, you know, we have to have that command presence, that command bearing um, in order to get across uh, what we believe our profession carries out. Um, that's the kind of the thing that, you know, you just have to be able to sell it to the inmates and uh, do that effectively. Uh, and it takes time. You know, you, I don't think that there's anyone that, you know, just settles into this and they automatically feel confident and secure in everything they're doing. 
because they haven't made all of those decisions in their life. They haven't dealt with, you know, life and death. They haven't dealt with uh, the battles that we have to face, uh, the riots that we put down, um, the crimes that we discover, uh, the people that we have to handcuff, the times that we have to use force. But it should be something that you step into and that you flush out and that you work to fulfill because I'll tell you, society is really is really counting on you. So are your brothers and sisters in in this. And uh, you know, we're the I mean, we're the last standing bastion between uh between the public and you know absolute chaos. <laughs> uh oh, did Anthony disappear? So I was anyway. muted. I was muted. I was muted. <laughs> he was muted. I was still, listen, I was still here waving like, hey, why can't you guys hear me? Uh, I can't too tiny on my screen. Oh, well, yeah, using your phone, Russ. Uh, you know, hey, hey uh, Joe, what, what, Joe, you were a lieutenant, you know, watching your officers from afar. I mean, what are some <laughs> of the signs where you would see that a directive, you know, was something they believed in or on the adverse of that, when you saw signs of maybe a directive like, ah, this person needs to be talking to because I, I feel they're a bit hesitant. Yeah, I mean, body language, body language is is 80% of communication. You can definitely tell the difference between a command presence no and, and, and a hesitant no, just, you know, just in body language. You know, uh, somebody who's, who's, who's always doing this number when they're talking or nervous fidgeting and, and they say, no, I don't think so, versus somebody saying no, just a straight across no. So, you know, uh, you know, when to, you know, when to step in and, and, you know, when somebody's hesitant and that's, that's when you pull them aside, you know, and, and Russ said it best, not everybody comes in 100% confident right off the bat. It's not something that you have coming straight in. That's something that, you know, you have to develop over time, but the confidence does build. And once the confidence build, the rest, the, the rest falls in place. Let me get that. And uh, hey, Butch, let me ask you a question on this, Bush, because I, I think, you know, especially from the highest level, um, how does someone build their confidence, especially let's say you're just coming out of the academy or it's your first day working in a prison. And, and guys, I want to tell you something, guys, real quick before before Butch answers this. I remember my first day entering the prison. I did work in a female facility, but having said that, when you're walking into that yard, because we did have to walk through an active yard to get to the unit, all eyes go right at you. They're looking right at you and they're asking so many things to themselves. You know, they're passing judgment. They're asking probably, you know, maybe if, if, if they think you, they could set you up, whatever it is. But all eyes start to focus on you. And right when you enter through, you have to have to have confidence. I have seen this happen where you get the rookies that come in and all the inmates are watching this rookie for the first time toward the unit. And when the inmate, when the rookie looks back at the inmates, all of a sudden, when they get the inmates' eyes right at them, they put their head down. That first little thing that you just did on day one, when the inmates were looking at you and you put your head down and you keep on moving forward, that first impression matters. In the inmates' mind, when they see that, you know, oh, you just put your head down, you just averted, you, you just averted, what is it, um, averted, averted, right? Or you just evaded, whatever it is. You, you ignored eye contact. Let's just say that. I, I think it's averted. You averted eye contact, automatic sign of weakness. So having said that, they're already, as soon as you go in, probably the whole yard will be talking about, yo, you saw what happened there? So we looked at him. You saw what that rookie did? Put his head down and walked up the unit the whole way and didn't even bother looking back our way. So so even from the first day moving forward, uh, Butch, what are some of the things that you think can help build someone's confidence so they could be truly effective in this world? Well, hopefully the training academy is going to have a program where they uh, teach, uh, you know, the, the things, the techniques that you need to have to address those early days on in corrections. I think Russ mentioned it's going to take some time to build up the knowledge you need uh, to, to, to have that confidence. Uh, hopefully... You know, when you first start, people got you moving around. You might be working one shift, you know, for a week, second shift for another, third shift for another. So you're going to have different different interaction with the inmate population. Hopefully you listen to your supervisors. But I think the number one thing that you may need, um, you know, people come from all different backgrounds. So, you know, people who came from the military and may have established some rank in the military, then get out and now are in corrections. 
sort of already have that command presence. And they may also have developed, which I think is the most, you have to have the courage to, to you know, have that confidence. And early on, you, you know, I can remember, you even have to fake it sometimes. Uh, I may not have the answer, but they're not going to know I don't have the answer by the way I'm acting or the, you know, uh, but it's balance as well. You know, if you go too far one way, you know, uh, you could have a hard way to go. But I, th I think courage is the most important thing. I think the early training is another. Um, I think that, you know, in most facilities or most agencies now, you have that on-the-job training so you're not left alone. I think that's some valuable time to be able to develop a little bit of that courage because you're going to need the confidence and the knowledge just for basic commands, count time, you know, you know, step up to the bars, uh, chow time, or no, chow's closed, or can you do this, can you do that? I mean, it, it's a rush. The first couple of weeks are hectic, and you're going to have to learn and have that knowledge, um, and hopefully supervisors will help. Uh, but they're going to leave you out there. They're going to check to see, you know, how you're doing, how you do it. Uh, at that level, at the entry level, it's, um, you know, I think that might be some of the hardest part. And then, you know, again, we're talking about inmates here, but, you know, it's the same thing with authority when you become a supervisor. I, I think that's a, you know, how you carried yourself as a line person. And then all of a sudden you're a supervisor. Uh, you know, you're going to have to develop different skills and your reputation is going to follow you into that. So um, knowledge, confidence, training, all of those are important things. And I think, you know, courage, some of your personality, some people are not going to have that uh, courage at first. I think it comes with, you know, with experience uh, and, and learning some different things. But uh, you're going to have to develop that courage to to, you know, to face those challenges, because there is going to be challenges, as you said. And I love that example as the eye contact. And boy, anybody that's ever been in prison for the first time, that is exactly how it happens, right? Mm -hmm. You get out mm -hmm. there and they're eyeballing you and where are your eyes going? You know, are you giving the mean look back? Uh, you know, is it a stare down or are you bashful and looking the other way? They're going to eat that stuff up. But um, I think with courage, all, all the mistakes you make early on, I think, you know, can be corrected if, if you're paying attention and you've got some good, you know, good mentors and good teachers and your training is adequate and you study, you know, knowledge is power. If, if, if you study your post orders and you understand the policies and the procedures and the protocol, uh, you know, you're going to have a hand up on the folks that don't. Yeah. And I want to mention something, two things that you said, uh, Definitely on your first day, guys, your support should complement those vulnerabilities. I mean, I'll be honest with you, even up until today, uh, I, I still feel a certain way uh, when you get all these inmates looking at you. I mean, I don't, I don't think that shifts. I don't even think you want to get used to that. I think that's a good thing to, you know, keep yourself on your toes. But the one thing is you don't want to shift your gaze. Look at that there. See what I did there? Because I can't forget if it's advert or I know I'm not saying it right. And we had divert. We had a bunch of words. So I decided to be a little creative. I, I kind of went the David Schillen way, maybe probably. And I said, shift your gaze. So I thought that was pretty, pretty unique, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I want to mention something, too, guys. I, I found this out to be good as well before we get to Dave. So in the book I write, I talk about expectation and rules. And I, I want to mention something that makes sense. Sometimes there's a lot of uh, people that have problem enforcing rules. You know, and it, it, maybe it's a weakness, I get it, or maybe they've just never been in a position. So now they're in corrections and people are challenging the rules of the facility. And sometimes it's hard for them to stand behind those rules. So I'm going to share a story real quick where I think that this could truly apply with a good way of being introduced uh, into the position of authority that we have, the, pre the perception of authority. So check this out, guys. A little bit of a story real quick. When I first started the female facility, um, there was an, an inmate that we had just gotten from reception that was uh, right off the get go. She went from reception out into the one of the GP housing units when she was assigned and she did what she had to do to, you know, get her status. And she took out about three inmates, literally, almost immediately when she entered the yard. So, of course, the codes called. We run there, you know, as the officers, we secure the inmates uh, that were involved in the fight. 
uh, take him over to medical to be evaluated. And then we go ahead and place him back in the, uh, you guess you say the pre-hearing area uh, until they get their charges heard. So uh, that night, uh, and this is a very important story for me because guys, to be honest with you, as I move up now, my direct effect is mostly with my staff. Uh, but on the front line, I really enjoyed my interactions with the inmate. I think what makes us a little bit different than the police is that we're when we walk in the projects, no one goes to hide. We walk amongst them all where like in the police, sometimes when they go in the projects, everybody runs and we walk right in the midst of it. So we have a lot of forced interactions with individuals that we wouldn't normally interact with. And it could become very challenging. Uh, but if you're intentional, there's so much to learn in regards to just interacting with people from that have different lifestyles and, 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 and different levels of influence and diff making different choices. So anyway, I secured, I had secured the female earlier, put her into the pre-hearing uh, spot of the facility. So uh, I guess you can kind of say like an isolated confinement unit. And um, that night I actually worked a double and that was one of my areas. I had to, I had to go, uh, t go do the officer's break in. So as I was doing my rounds, I heard a female crying in the cell. So I went back, logged in, you know, what I had to log in and went back to the cell to see what was going on. I saw the female in the back and I heard the female crying. And you know, again, this is my first interaction with her. And I realized that, hey, this was the female that I was escorting. Totally different inmate now. Because mind you, when I was escorting her to uh, medical after the fight and whatnot, she was a little bit more hardcore, a little bit more... Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, just a little bit more hardcore this time here. She's, you know, overwhelmed with emotion. So I remember telling her that it's good to cry. That's good to feel what you're feeling because it's a reminder that you deserve to be in a better place than this, that you made a bad choice. And the moment you start to accept it, the moment that this doesn't become overwhelming is the moment that you've accepted your life at this position. So you should enjoy your body screaming, telling you that you don't want to be here because maybe you could do something better or more with your life. Now, granted, um, the inmate gets shipped out to do her time at another facility. That's how it was back then. About six months later, she came back. And I remember telling the inmates in the mess hall they had to take off their hats. She was one of them. She stepped out, remembered the dialogue I had from six months ago. And she said something to me that was very unique to me that day. She said, Ganji, no one has ever given me a positive expectation in my life. So now granted, sometimes we look at people and we wonder why they do foolish things, but we, we, we judge them based on our own experiences and we may not know what their experiences are. You know, I, I remember a story where someone had said, hey, wh why does someone want to go to jail? It's like, well, have you ever seen where they lived on the streets? At least here they get three meals and, and a place to sleep. Anyway, when she said that, that made me think a little bit. Now, mind you, throughout the rest of her time, this girl was determined. She never came back to the facility. She did everything correct. So once in a while, there was conflict, yes. But mind you, guys, she's in a prison. I mean, uh, there's going to be a lot of counter influence to the positive that she needs to do. But she stuck with her guns, fell back sometimes, but really did what she had to do, made it out. And from what I hear, is very successful. That's a determined, determined individual. Again, we give the advice. The most they could do is apply it. But having said that, what I learned from that is this. Expectation makes us work together for you to reach your greatest potential. That's where the word account accountability comes from. You know, I'm not holding you accountable for some punitive measure. I'm holding you accountable because I know in my heart, you could be better than this. So having said that, I learned that if I give the inmates to some extent, expectation first, this is what's expected of you. Now, mind you guys, what's expected of you is in compliance with the rules. But mind you, think about what expectation does. It's an inward thing. It means I expect you to do something because there's an end game around. And, and, and at the end of the day, if you succeed at these positive expectations, you reap the reward of hopefully uh, a, a growth mindset, uh, you know, changing the ways that were negative. Now, mind you, if that didn't work, if I couldn't get the expectation, then what am I going to do now? Now I push to the rules. Now I'm going to motivate by external incentive. You know, now it's like, you're going to do this because this is what has to be done. Now, this really has nothing to do about her own personal growth. You know, this is more about the rules. So I think that applies a lot when it comes to earning that level of authority. I think it's easier to 
you know, literally gain compliance. Uh, again, if, if, if you can, it's not an emergent situation. Just if you're able to communicate compliance, you know, set a level of expectation, set what's expected. I do it with my staff all the time as well. You know, these are their expectations and you watch them meet and excel it. But having said that, you know, I think that's a great way to empower somebody to do the right thing. But when they start to fall back, now you cross into that rules. Now I'm going to go ahead and enforce the rules. But think about it, guys. You're not jumping in at 60 miles per hour right off the bat. You're being introduced. So having said that, I tried the expectations. It didn't work. So now here's what I here's what you're going to do. Because now if you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. Hey, Dave, what's your thoughts on expectation versus rules and how, if done properly, if, if introduced properly? I mean, it could help you build some confidence towards, uh, you know, having that perception of authority, just more of a respectful way. When you consider expectations versus rules, uh, there's a big difference between the two about really how they make you feel. Expectations implies we're going to empower somebody to be able to do something where the rules imply restriction, uh, negative reinforcement, don't do this, don't do that, which is what most rules are made of. So if we put out expectations first, we're saying, hey, I believe in you enough that you can do this. Please get this done. You're making a working partnership happen right there with the inmate, with your coworker, with whoever. Uh, if it does devolve into that, they don't meet expectations. It's exactly like you said. Then we fall back on the rules. That's our fail safe. And right there, we go to the ask, make, ask, tell, and make model right there. I may have heard that somewhere. I read that somewhere. I'm not sure. No, no, you, you, you know, you read that. That's that's in my book because I got that from Russ. Wait, wait, were you joking or you 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 remember where oh, you got true. that from? Oh yeah, yeah. So hold on. I, I, if you're going to introduce the ask, tell, make model, go ahead, Russ. Hey, th- wait. First off, thank you for the plug there, Dave. Well played, sir. Well Just played. Saying. By the way, both things are actually in the book: expectation versus rules and ask, tell, make. Russ, you mind elaborating on what the ask, tell, make, and how does that help with confidence? I mean, so, you know, ask, tell, make is just, it's it, basically, it's a gradation, gradation or it's a, or it's a hierarchy of what we resort to when we need to deal with an inmate. Uh, the first thing that we do is ask them, you know, and we do that with, you know, some degree, some, um, you know, modicum of decorum and politeness, you know, can you do something? Maybe even we say, please, uh, but it's the, it's the first step, you know, when we have to start ratcheting things up. Because there may be an issue with regards to, you know, some type of non-compliance, failure to follow orders, that kind of thing. The next thing that you have to do is you have to bring it up to that point where you are telling them. You are telling them, you are giving them an order, and you're not leaving anything to the imagination. It's not, I'm kind of, you know, just upping my level of asking here a little bit. No, this is where you are direct and you are verbally forceful. And you are making sure that there is no misunderstanding on either of our parts that this is going to happen. It is going to happen now. And then the last part is make. And so uh, make, um, you know, when I use that term, I want everybody to understand that we have to make them within the confines of uh, what they call a legitimate penological interest, right? We can't just do things that are arbitrary and decide that we're going to step up and just go from ask, tell, make, just because, you know, we feel like it. No, there has to be some uh, meat on the bone with regards to that. And we have to be doing it, like I say, for a legitimate penological um, reason. And, you know, sometimes that's things like, hey, turn around and cuff up, you know, and then they're saying, no, I'm not going to. I'm giving you an order. And, you know, the next thing is, is we have to go hands on. All right. That's usually the typical type of thing where we're thinking about ask, tell, make. Um, so, uh, you know, when you keep that in mind, it gives you a way to reinforce rules, but to also have, you know, uh, a little bit of flexibility along the way before you have to take that final measure into your hands. And I'm, I'm going to show you guys something, see how it works. Watch this. Hold on. Hey, babe, can you make me a nice coffee? Make me a nice coffee. <laughs> no. I never get the make part. I barely make it past the tell. 
No, but let's see if she let's see if she does it. I doubt it. I'm I'm trying. I want iced coffee, guys. I really do. Uh, I asked her about it. I asked about an. I did ask about an hour ago. And by the way, I want you to know she wasn't on the phone, uh, because if she was, I that was all acting improv actually. So I'm very proud of myself. I got that. Uh, all right. So so uh, hey hey Joe, out, out of curiosity, you know, obviously I, I would love your thoughts on before we go into the supervisors and stuff like that. I I, I know that some people. Uh, maybe there could be some front line they may, that may feel that the expectation is a softer measure uh, when it comes to that perception of authority or, you know, introducing those directives. But what's your thoughts on, again, if, if, it's, if you're able to communicate that, what's your thoughts on expectation first, if possible, and then if need be the implementation of the rules? Or as we said, like Russ said, it's very similar to the ask, the ask, uh, the ask, uh, what is it? Ask, ask, oh tell. Yeah, ask, tell, make model. Jesus, I'm off. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, your your command presence, the way the way you communicate, the way you verbalize it, will have a lot to do with it. You know, it, it's it's kind of like dealing with your kids sometimes. You know, there's a there's a big difference. And hey, uh, do me a favor, would you, and and go pick up your clothes. Versus, you know, you finally had a gut full of it, and you tell them, hey, go pick those up now. You know, big difference between expectation and, and, and the actual policy directive. You know, your expectations, especially for, for officers who uh, carry out squads. Um, you know, I've carried quite a few of my time. Um, outside yard squads, paint squads, you know, whatever. Um, you know, when you first take a squad, you know, you're, you're always keeping the policy in mind, number one. Um, and you lay out your expectations right across, you know, up front and direct this way. They know what your expectations are and they know they expect you to get it done within the, within the parameters of the, of the policy. But number one, you got to have the self-confidence to verbalize that. You got to have the confidence in yourself and you got to be confident enough to verbalize that where, you know, the, the clear picture, you know, cause everybody knows what the policy is and everybody's always going to fall back to the policy. But what makes or break somebody is the way they verbalize it. You know, your 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 verbal presence, you know, along with body language. Those are the those are the two things that, that need to be fine tuned. And like Butch uh, Butch said, you know, the academy is the uh, great place to, to start with that, you know, because that's your time to actually practice. You know, and 25 years ago, 30 years ago, excuse me. You know, they actually brought convicts in for us to role play on when it came to directives and when it came to issuing orders. And the convicts would actually grade you on it. They would tell you, boss, look, if, if we were on a if we were on a block. I would have done run you off. And this is why. Number one, you don't look me in the face. You're not confident in, in what you're telling me. You know, every other word you were stuttering or jittering or, you know, so back then versus today, big difference, big difference. But, you know, when it comes down to it between expectation and policy, it's always going to be your your actual command presence and how you carry it out. You know, what, what was the old saying? Say what you mean and mean what you say. Mm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you know, you know what, guys, I mean, as we talk about, it, I just want people to know that, you know, there are different ways to. Um, get compliance from an inmate. But I'll be honest with you, especially if it's just your normal routine, like Butch had mentioned before, you can't always operate on 60 miles an hour. It, it, you know, in the book, I mentioned in the book as well, is that a lot of people, uh, when they're looking to get into this profession, a lot of them will talk about physical stuff. Like, hey, Gange, I feel like I'm too small to work in this profession. And, you know, uh, you know uh, I'm a woman, Ganji, and I don't know, you think I can really take down these men if I need to? And it's like, hey, guys, everybody that goes in this profession has strengths and, you know, they also have weaknesses and we're all there to compliment. But most of this profession is really just a mental game. 
I mean, for those that come in, I think they have to be aggressive every day to gain compliance, trust and believe that's going to wear thin on the inmate population. That's going to wear thin on your mental health. So, I mean, the people that ask that question, the first thing I tell them is, to be honest with you, and I know it may sound cliche, but it's not about your physical stature. It's about how you carry yourself. Can you be respectful? You know, I mean, you know, that's the key, you know, and do you have confidence in the authority that you're given? Listen, I'm five foot five, you know, uh, I could have gotten beaten up in a female facility. You know, trust and believe these girls could fight, you know, it's, but I didn't walk around even with the men, you know, if you walk around in fear because you think every interaction is going to end in something physical, then you're never going to give out an order. You're never going to give out a directive because there's always going to be that one person that's going to beat the hell out of you. So you can't, it's, it's, it's not about that. It's about being confident in the job that you have to do and knowing hopefully that if something does happen, people have your back. Like, I'll be honest with you guys, even as an administrator, I walk around the worst of the worst in my state. I'm at the highest level of security in my state. But the funniest thing is, I never feel safer. I'm truly safe when I'm walking around the people that are meant to do their job. So here I am around the worst of the worst, but I feel safe. I feel safe because I know at the end of the day, I can issue my directives and people got my back if need be. You know, because that's what their job's for. But having said that, if you think that we have to go in and be aggressive all the time, and at the end of the day, you're more concerned about the physical element of the job, then you're going to be so afraid to give an order because the end result is, well, what about they want to fight me? You know, it's not about that. It's about being strong in the mindset, knowing that you have a job to do. And could that happen? Of course it could happen. Of course it could happen. But at the end of the day, let me tell you something. Usually, and I know guys, we're dealing with inmates, and, and nine times out of ten, yes, we do have inmates that could be impulsive. Don't get me, don't, um, don't get me wrong. We could have that, but I will tell you something, guys. Believe it or not, a lot of inmates expect you to do your job. They may challenge you, but they expect you to do your job. The moment you're weak, the moment you give a yes when you shouldn't give a yes because you're afraid, is the moment they know I got you. I got you. So again, you know, just being able to give out that directive and and really being confident. Oh, wait, hold on, guys. Wait, hold on. No, just, I said, I let me ask you a question. You don't have to show yourself. I get it. But I want to ask you a question. Here's the mic. Did you get me the coffee? Because I either, this is Russ's model. I want you to tell you, this comes totally from Russ. Um, and, yeah, so, and, and by the way, guys, she Russ, she can't hear you because you're in my headset. So I just, so by the way, she brought me the coffee. But Russ said like this, did, you know, when did you ask for the coffee? And I said, about an hour ago, about an hour ago. And he goes, did you try the ask, tell, make model? It could speed things up. I said, well, I did ask her. Uh, She hasn't given it to me. He goes, you fucking tell her. And I said, okay. So I told her, and it looks like Russ was right. Thank you, Russ. Your thoughts? No. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. Hold on. Yeah. Even, yeah. Russ is smacking me. There it is. There it is. (laughs) There it is. And by the way, those are her fingers, not mine. Uh, <laughs> all right. uh, hey, so go ahead, guys. So it, it works on inmates. <laughs> doesn't doesn't so much work on on wives or spouses. Hey, um, so again, I just want to I want to get to the supervisor side. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with uh, we just did Joe. So I want to go with Butch first. You know, Joe. I I, I I mean Butch. When people start this profession, obviously it's going to be very hard for to get for them to get that perception uh, perception of authority. I think it's something that has to be cultivated. I think it's something that eventually they really grow into. I mean, yes, the academy is going to give you a foundation. Don't get me wrong, guys. I want you guys to hear me out on something real quick. The academy is going to give you a foundation based on policies and procedures. And that's great. You're going to lean on that when you begin your career. But having said that, when you're new, it's the discretion in applying it that could be a little bit nerve wracking at first, you know, okay, I get, these are things I have to do, but then you're applying it into a world that could be very, very dynamic. So having said that, that's where the support comes in because at the end of the day is we want to support you and complete that picture of perception of authority because we know when you're coming in, you're going to feel a little bit vulnerable. So our job right at the get go as, as, as coming in as supervisors, coming in as senior staff is let's embrace that rookie. Because at any moment, if that rookie feels lost and they have nowhere to go to, they're going to lose that perception of authority. And on day one, it's very hard for you to pick that back up. Reason being, and I'll tell you why it's hard for you to pick back up, is because you don't have enough experience with the inmates where they can kind of, oh, that really wasn't him. 
you know, they, they know a little bit more of you at that point, or you yourself don't have enough past successful experiences to build in confidence when you slip up. So our job right now on day one is to make sure, even if you do fail, that we constantly make our effort to lift you up so you can maintain that level of authority. But, but again, with that said, uh, Butch, real quick, you know, supervisors, senior staff, especially with the new boots, what can we do to reinforce that perception for new staff that's coming in that may feel a little lost and confused in, in, in this world of corrections? Uh, like I started before, I think that, you know, the, the in, not in-service training, but initial training as well as on-the-job training and, you know, some direct supervision. Hopefully, you know, you're not left alone to make those mistakes very early on in your career, like the first few days. And I know sometimes that does happen, but um, to make sure that they – you know, someone's assigned to them and supervisors need to make sure that they're setting a good example. You know, I was sitting here thinking them way back, you know, 35 years ago, you know, everyone's going to have their, you know, uh, their own way. They're going to make their own way. Uh, everyone's going to be a little bit different. You know, some some techniques. I remember correction officers that were, you know, they had a personality where, uh, you know, they would inject humor into their job and the inmates would laugh at them not not laugh at them but laugh with them and they would get you know they would have influence over the inmates because they had injected humor or, or th their method you know other guys were more dry and direct and uh you know that worked for them so you know hopefully you have good role models and they, and they are gonna supervisors you know they're gonna model the way whether it's a good way or a bad way you know, uh, the newer correction officers are going are gonna to follow that. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to have to learn their own way. Um, you know, I learned early on, I saw some very good correction officers that, you know, had influence over the inmates and they, they carried their authority well, but they used different techniques to get that done. And most of it was through reputation over many, you know, several years of, of being consistent and fair. Uh, and I also saw, saw correction officers that had no way with the inmates. They had little influence over them other than the badge and the, and the, the you know, the consequence. Uh, so, you know, I think supervisors need to model the way. Hopefully we have supervisors that are effective at it. Uh, hopefully that's why they are supervisors because they showed, you know, in previous, you know, in previous days that they were good correction officers and they had influence over the inmates. And that was part of the reason they did get promoted. Uh, but, you know, the training program has to understand that, you know, like you said, we, we can give, you know, classes, policy and procedure, but the actual practical application is, is, is the real key in how we develop our own techniques. Uh, and hopefully they'll, you know, the training program will outline different techniques. And I think the new people will see, you know, who they're assigned with and supervisors and watch the interaction between seasoned correction officers and supervisors. And, and, and hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll learn their way. And, and I think that, you know, periodic evaluation as well. I mean, Gan, you know uh, who the correction officers are, you know, and I'm, I had correction officers that worked 20 years and wrote a handful of disciplinary reports. Then I have correction officers that been there a year and wrote, you know, one a day. So everybody has a different technique. Uh, you know, can an officer run a unit? Is it clean? You know, you can walk into a place and see if rules are being followed or if the place is chaos. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, with seasoned, administrators you can tell if it's a difficult unit which is you know as opposed to let's say an honor unit you know but th there's a whole lot of different techniques that can be employed and a whole lot of different methods to be used to have influence and to maintain that authority over the inmates and and i and i think that it's a learned process uh some people come in with some techniques uh through prior experiences but you know in prison it's a lot different um i I saw folks that were real good with the mental health inmates. They just had a knack with having influence over the mental health folks. And then I saw guys that were real good uh, with the hardcore inmates, the very, very hardcore inmates. These guys had 
you know, very good techniques and influence over them, yet struggled or didn't have the patience for maybe the mental health type in me, you know? So uh, there's expertise in all of them and, and outlining all the different, you know, types and how they're going to make the training is important, uh, whether it's in service, initial entry level training or on the job training, it, it's all very important. Yeah, and I want I want to add something, Joe, because there's a couple of things that I mean, uh, uh, Butch. There's a couple of things that you said that were spot on uh, that could lead into maybe when we break in with, with Dave real quick. But I want to mention something. So, guys, I, I want to mention that when you start this profession, you have to lean on the rules. I mean, I, I, we talked about the expectation. I get that, but that really comes with some level of discretion. And when you first start in this profession, you're getting ready to work behind the wall. You're going to have to enforce the rules. Uh, one is because it's it's good practice at first. You can always you know, you know, move back, you know, a little bit more from that, but you should go in hardcore because also the inmates are going to test you. So you can't come off soft because it doesn't give you that foundation. So, I mean, that's one oh one. you know, go in saying no, uh, and then eventually work your way into having that discretion. But I want to mention something that, that Butch mentioned, um, that I thought was spot on. Um, there are some senior officers that rule by the pen. Now guys, there are certain things. I want you to hear me out. There are certain things that you're going to have to write up, you know, fights, assault. You know, obviously, I'm not talking about those emergent situations where you have to write things up. I I get it. Outside of that, there are like normal house rules, discretionary stuff that you can do either way. Sure, you could write it up and maybe it's supported or maybe there's other ways you can handle it. And that's where discretion comes into play. And I'm going to tell you a way uh, that I learned this out pretty quick. Um, One thing is I want to run my unit. I do. So I want to interact and I want to handle the problems that I feel I can handle at my level. So uh, unless I have to write a charge, I'm going to try to break away from it and do what I can to kind of communicate things and give them my expectations as opposed to writing it and then expecting a supervisor to come in and run the unit for me or take the inmate out because, you know, I I just can't deal with them no more. Because at the end of the day, those are all Band-Aid solutions. Because here I am, I'm in this unit long term. I got to look to let them understand what I'm about. And that's going to be walking around, making adjustments and not be so quick with the pen, not to, not not be so heavy with the pen. And yes, could there be some minor rule infractions that, you know, uh, I'm not writing up? Yes, but it but doesn't mean I'm not ignoring it. I mean, I mean, it doesn't mean I'm ignoring it. It means that I have another way I'm going to handle it, which makes it known that I'm still addressing the matter. And the reason why I know this matters is when it comes to minor rules violations in a restorative housing unit or a restrictive housing unit or an isolated confinement, they could give two shits about pen and paper. Because at the end of the day, the punitive doesn't matter to them. It, trust me, they're already locked up. They don't care. You know, they're being problematic. They don't care. I have seen officers try to run a highly restrictive restorative housing unit where inmates are getting in trouble and now go into that area, and that's now your unit, and they try to run it by using pen and paper, and they go nowhere with it. And then I've seen officers that can keep it quiet just by being respectful and giving out those levels of expectation. So having said that, you know, I I truly believe that what does work in the long run is that communication that you're having. Russ would said it best, it's in the book, that firm, fair, and consistent, but guys, but not the firm, fair, and consistent that people think. The context of firm, fair, and consistent, and Russ will explain as we get back to it, uh, is is more about you inwards, how you feel about yourself, and then being able to go ahead and carry that out as opposed to, oh, that's how we treat the inmates. No, that's how you have to see yourself first. So with that said, you know, if you want to quickly practice writing everybody up and doing it that way for minor rule infractions. Then one day you get picked up and you get put into a max unit where it's highly restrictive. Inmates are constantly problematic and you got to run that unit. You're going to realize those inmates don't care about that written charge at all. They care about, you know, some type of respect going both ways. So I've seen officers being able to really walk that unit and it's quiet and they don't have to write up a thing. Because literally there's some respect or something going on where that officer gives out these levels of expectation and these inmates do strive to meet it. Uh, Again, nothing's ever 100%. You're always going to have people that could obviously say, well, that doesn't happen with everyone. Nothing. You're dealing with human behavior. Nothing's going to ever be 100%. But if you want to roll the dice, 
I would roll the dice betting on learning that discretion as opposed to writing everything up. But, you know, that's my opinion first. I, I would like to go through the, the panel on this. I'll start with Dave. Uh, what's your thoughts on what I just said? You know, the write-up, the discretionary. I mean, let's go with you first, Dave, and then we'll go to Russ, Joe, and Butch, because I really want your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I feel that when you're first starting off, when you're a new person, uh, you do have to rely on the rules for everything. Uh, the inmate handbook, everything else that's in there that the expectations are laid out for the guys. Uh, that's what you have to follow. That's the bottom line right there. Uh, that being said, it's also important that the FTOs, the veteran staff are embracing, as Butch said, the new staff and helping to mentor these guys. Uh, they shouldn't be left alone on the first day. They shouldn't be left alone in the second week. They're not ready for all that yet. That FTO, that trainer, that veteran staff member, they're modeling behavior for this new person. They're guiding them along. They're showing them, hey, okay, this is how this guy does stuff. Will that work for me? Uh, Butch mentioned some people can use humor real well. I've seen people do that very successfully. I've seen people try it, and it backfires utterly and completely. Next thing you know, the whole place is locking up, and everybody's running down there because, you know, we have an inmate that's going off. So it, everybody has to find their own style, but that comes over time. But at first, you have to have that solid base to go along with. Say no, follow the rules, do your thing, write people up as needed. At the same time, we also work in a very human field to where once you do get that stuff down, you're going to develop your own style with things, and everybody has their thing when you're an officer. Uh, you walk through the unit. I work in a direct supervision facility, so in the morning, whole place opens up. You're milling around amongst all the guys when they're out. Do cell inspections. Okay, no. You know, some people have a thing with beds being made properly, so that's what they enforce. You know, cell cleanliness, all that different type of stuff. You know, do they have items up in the window, for instance? That's one of our rules that we have, no items up in the window. Some people are hard on that. So it's just, uh, like I said, it's a very human thing, but you have to develop that base first. That's yeah. extremely important. Yeah, I, I love that, Dave, because I... I... I love, I love what you talked about. You talked about the small things that really don't pose a threat. Uh, but having said that, all because I don't write it doesn't mean it's not being addressed. But, but don't get me wrong. If I ask for it repetitively and you're still not doing it, then there will be a point where I finalize it. But again, look what I did. Yeah. Expectation to rules. You know, I, I gave you an expectation. We refused to follow along. I think Alicia said it best. Um she said policies and procedures are there to guide, but not everything falls under those guidelines. There are always exceptions. Hey, Russ, what's your what's your what's your thoughts on all this, Russ? And and, and can you mention also the firm fair and consistent one more time? Russ, you're muted, Russ. Hold on, let me say. I got it. I got it. All right. So when I'm out there in the housing units. Uh, the thing that I used to think of, uh, right or wrong, is that, you know, every uh, every infraction and every misdemeanor that I spend time chasing down is one less chance for me to find a felony. But that was just me. I know that there is a sense and a demand sometimes that we have to do uh, some lower level write-ups um, in order to manage what the unit is doing. Uh, I see lots of people, though, at times they get caught. Uh, they get caught in the minutia so much that they are the ones that they never find a shank. They never find an inmate beat up. They never find any dope on anyone. They never find a cell phone. Um, and that's because the inmates are running game on them. And they know that this person is going to get suckered in to the first tattoo needle that they, that they see. That doesn't mean that we ignore it. But what it does mean is sometimes we have to really prioritize what we do. And for me, it was all about, you know, felonies first every single time. Um, so now getting back to the whole firm, fair and consistent, uh, firm, fair and consistent to me is about what I need to operate. If I operate within those guidelines, firm, fair and consistent for me, then I'm able to anchor myself in policy, procedure, state law and all of those other things and not wander outside the bounds, not risk losing my job. Um, and uh, more than that, yes, the inmates do benefit from that, but it's as an indirect result. 
because otherwise it's so easy to get caught up in some of the bullshit things that happen and wander outside that reservation. I use them for my guideposts to direct what I should do, uh, but not because the inmates deserve it. It's because I deserve it. I like that, Russ. That's the way you ended it uh, is exactly, that's why I couldn't explain it. I love that. It's not because the inmates deserve it. That was powerful. It's because I deserve it. Um, that, I think that's the key. I think that's why when people throw out that firm, fair, and consistent, it's great to see that we're trying to find a way to give better context to that. I mean, I think that to me uh, was powerful the way you you ended that. Hey, Joe, what's your thoughts on what we've been discussing? I want to get your thoughts on discretion and automatic write-ups. I mean, you were a lieutenant, so I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the, the way they're training now versus the way they were training 30 years ago, not that I'm trying to tell on my age and I'm older than dirt, but, you know, when I came in 30 years ago, I was actually taught my job by a convict. There was no, you know, there wasn't much of a training academy. There was enough to teach you the policies and procedures of, you know, what a convict should be doing and all that stuff. But when it came to act, the actual application, I was actually taught my job by a convict. I was taught by a convict how to run ins and outs on the day room. I was taught by a convict how to roll the doors for ins and outs. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, the way it's the way it the teaching is totally different. But as far as you know, disciplinary cases, you know, you got those people. You know, when you tell them to, you know, make sure they not prioritize but you know when they spot an infraction you know they're they're taught that if you don't assert yourself within the first week on the job that the, the the convicts won't respect you what they fail to really teach you is you know if you use good respectful verbal judo you can obtain the same compliance as a disciplinary case and later on down the road you'll gain more respect you know as a shift lieutenant i had i had you know, COs that 20 years in the system never wrote a disciplinary case. And then, you know, I got one that's been in for, you know, six, seven months, and I get eight to nine cases a night or a day from this boss, you know, and, and it kind of makes you wonder, well, Jesus Christ, did you even talk to the convict? Did you try to informally resolve it? You know, I found, you know, way back when the easiest way if you see a boss who is not confident in their abilities or timid in the way they handle their job what i used to do is i would put them down on the dorms with the older convicts and i would give them menial task this is what i want you to do tonight this is what i want done tonight i want that convict to to knock all the dust off of these water pipes i want these water pipes repainted and I want it done before end of shift. You know, and over time, you find that you build confidence in that boss because they start getting compliance verbally instead of using that paper. You know, paper, like you said, you know, there's some things you just flat have to write up. You know, weapons, fights, you know, possession of hooch, drugs, you know, that it's automatic. Uh, an assault on staff or a threat to staff, you know, definitely automatic. But the the less the less menial bullshit you know um a lot of that you need to set your expectations when you step onto that duty post the first you know you go down you go down a run or you hit a day room whatever hey look guys when i walk by your cell i don't want to see shit on the floor i don't want to see nothing hanging up and all your property better be put away where it's supposed to be or i'm going to tax you you know but a lot of that's got to do with the way you project yourself. If you go in there not sounding confident enough, then unfortunately you're going to have to use a paper to get your point across. But if you have the verbal skills to go in there and project what you want, you'll, you'll obtain better compliance and more respect from your peers and from the offender population. Because if you can't run your own area, that means somebody's going to have to come in and, and assist you in running your area. And not only does that take away from your authority, but it also, you know, it also diminishes your respect amongst your peers because now they feel they have to do your job because you're not confident enough to do it yourself. 
you know, so, you know, between the, the paper and verbal, I'll take verbal any day of the week. But, you know, like we said, there's some cases where you just have to put pa pen to paper, you know, for certain infractions. That's just the way it is. All right. Uh, so, Joe, I just want to say, Julie says, I can listen to Joe Pompano talk all day. Do you mind saying, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, something like a honey baby at the end? Because she loves you, Joe. <laughs> she loves you, Joe. It's the accent, Joe. She loves you. I don't have an accent. You know, whoever something... thought you'd see an Italian in uh, an Italian in Texas. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. See, I wish I had an <laughs> accent. Uh, hey, guys, we have a new member kinder than necessary. She works for uh, prison medical or maybe the jail medical side. But uh, again, uh, welcome to the family. Thank you for uh, joining us on Tear Talk. And also, I want to give a shout out to somebody real quick. Single mom. Maybe one day you'd like to come on the show. Single mom looks like she was formerly incarcerated. Uh, but it looks like she's moving forward and doing great with her life. And I love the fact that she's coming to this side to share with her story and be part of our family. So I just want to say, single mom, you are more than welcome here. Uh, uh, you know, thank you for taking the time to check out this channel. And I am truly honored to see you here. And obviously, uh, good luck in, in, in everything that you're doing moving forward. I, I sincerely uh, wish you the best. But, you know, it looks like you're doing great already, especially because you're hanging out with us. If I a little bias on that one. Oh, here they go. Love Joe's accent. Oh my! Hey, you know what? Hold on, you guys. Dave Schillen has a little bit of a droll too. You know, he's he's out of Minnesota. You know what I mean? So you know, he's got a bit of an accent too. I, I you know, it's and Butch, Butch has an accent, but everybody likes that Texas Walker Chuck Chuck Norris accent. Um, hey, hey, Butch, I wanted to get your thoughts one more time. I know you introduced the uh, the thought, but I, I wanted to get your thought one more time on you know the discretion versus, uh, you know, really running a unit by paper and pen. Now, there's balance. Uh, you know, everything in moderation, I think, is a good policy for everyone to follow, you know, in, in life, <laughs> not just as a correction officer. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what type of facility you work in where you can get away without writing D reports. But as, as you know, a couple of the panel members had mentioned, certainly fights and different things. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, if you're taking over a unit, I used to always, you know, when I was a young correction officer, I would tell the captain, I'll go work it because you're telling me to. And uh, we're going to party for about three weeks, but give me three weeks in the fourth and fifth and sixth weeks. And that, and from that point on, it's going to be smooth sailing, but it's going to be some rough going for three weeks in there. Um, you know, so. And, and I may have had to have uh, put pen to paper first three weeks. But after, you know, they got to know and understand what the expectations were, you know, things slowed down in that area. And I could probably talk to inmates to get them to do different things uh, more often. Um, so uh, everything in moderation, I think the circumstances dictate, uh, you know, how, wh where you can do it. I think, you know, in a minimum security, obviously, you know, you're probably going to write less D reports as opposed to a medium or a maximum. Um, I do, I do think that, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about maximum security and maybe restricted housing units. And one of the pet peeves, uh, you know, we talked about, you did a, you did a YouTube uh, a presentation on why do we sweat the small stuff? Uh, one of the pet peeves I had as an administrator was windows covered. And I'm going to tell you why I had a pet peeve with windows covered. And it's obvious because you couldn't see in it. And most of the time when the windows were covered, what was going on behind there was illegal or dangerous. And we had some, you know, folks who were, we found, uh, we go to do a stand and count and, you know, they're dead. And uh, the window was covered. And, you know, how are you doing checks? And, how were the checks with a you know with the hourly checks effective you know uh so you know everything in moderation if you had to write a d report you needed to write one if you didn't have to write one but you could get them to do it uh then you then you could do it that way as the administration as me as an administrator if you could get them to do it without a d report that's fine but the bottom line is they need to do it so whichever way they figured out how to get it done was fine with me and i think you know, I think you subscribe to that. Leave the how up to them. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but, you know, we did have rules. And, you know, another one of my pet peeves of if we weren't going to enforce rules, then why why did we have them? You know, there was a bunch of rules that I had where I, I saw folks, you know, this rule would never be enforced. And I used to ask my supervisors and shift commanders, 
do we need to remove that? Oh, you can't remove. We can't have people doing. Then get out there and then have the staff enforce it because uh, we have a rule. And I walk around. I manage by walking around, and I see you know windows covered and sheets over bars and so on and so forth. And and, and that's even you know shift by shift you can see a change in the different attitude of the inmates and the staff. I thought that you know the afternoon shift had a lot more influence for. Uh, enforcing rules in the day shift was a little bit more lax on occasion. Uh, but uh, I, I think everything in moderation, uh, Gange, and I think that, you know, the circumstances would dictate, you know, I think your techniques have to change with the circumstances. Like I said, if you're taking over a unit and, and you're the new officer, uh, you know, you may have to put some pen to paper more often than not. Uh, and then after a while, they get used to the understanding your expectations. I, I do agree 100 percent. And I think that folks, you know, maybe thinking about coming into corrections and people outside our our profession don't understand this. And uh, I do think that the inmates have some expectation of uh, that we need to control the place. They, they, they have some expectation or they have some need to want to feel safe if they don't feel safe because we're, you know, we can't run the place. They'll have their own methods to stay safe, whether it's gang affiliation, weapons, and so on and so forth. But mm. uh, they want some order. Uh, they have to do 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, you know, they want to be comfortable to some certain extent. Uh, and, you know, uh, they count on us to have the courage to have some type of order uh, so that they can do their time somewhat uh, in a, in a, Pleasant's not the right word, but neither is comfortable, but a controlled uh, fashion, a controlled fashion. Yes, uh, yeah, I do I, agree. I do agree with that. And uh, it doesn't mean it's, you know, that they're, they're nice guys or nice gals, or, uh, you know, that they're conforming with, with all the rules. Uh, they're still not breaking the rules inside, but there is some expectation of order. And, and that's our job. All right, now, I, I want to get to the second part of the dialogue, which is also important. Um, and then, uh, like, like right now, we talked about perception of authority. We talked about inward and carrying it out. So a lot of that, uh, at first, is on us. I get that. But having said that, sometimes we are not always supported by higher up. And therefore, even if we try to be consistent with our perception of authority, uh, there are certain things that higher ups do that circumvent that. And then they don't realize how that makes us feel when they walk out of the unit and we still have to maintain uh, and be effective in, in our daily duties. And by the way, I, I want to mention something so people understand what we're saying, because I don't want people to think that we're we're going back and forth when it comes to enforcing the rules. Yes, you could always go to a write up. But having said that, enforcing the rules could also be how you address it as long as it's addressed, because we never said that we're going to allow negative behavior. That's correct. You know, I'm going to address it. I'm going to talk to the inmate first. If they choose not to do it, if it becomes repetitive, then yes, I'm going to lean on the pen. But like we mentioned first, did I try talking to the inmate first or did I go right to the pen? But never once did we say it wasn't going to be addressed. You know, we went from what we said first, expectation to rules. I expect you to take that off. And then when you come back, hey, you didn't take it off. Now I'm going to go to the rules. And then that's where you could go to that pen if need be. Uh, but again, having that conversation, having those interactions, however challenging really is how we grow in our authority. And to be honest with you guys, I know this might sound crazy, guys, but you know this is the first step in how you handle your authority. Because I, I, I know this may sound crazy, guys, but there were some officers that I saw how they treated the inmates that I was concerned how they would treat me if they ever became supervisors. Now, I, I, am I wrong? I don't know. Am I wrong? I, I just want right. to see, uh, did I say something wrong? You know what? Hold on. Before we go to that next topic, I would love to get everybody's perspective on that. So I'm going to start with Russ on down, but I, I, I want to make sure, because sometimes it's tough, but I'm being honest with you. If I, I would work with certain officers and if they were really aggressive, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, wow, what would happen if they got promoted and they became my boss? Could I actually see? Let me ask you guys this and tell me if you agree with this, guys. You think how an officer or a frontline staff member, so whatever department, we have medical here, let's say uh, medical personnel. Do you think how they treat an inmate could eventually be reflective of, of how they treat their subordinates if they were 
going to move up? I'll start with Russ first. Yeah, you know, you have to you have to look at how a person um, on just how a person runs everything that they do in their life or at least everything that they run within the profession. Uh, you know, if they are unable to talk to an inmate, uh, you know, and th there's a time and a place to be hard as nails with those inmates. Don't don't get me wrong. There is. But if they don't, if they're only if they're just a one trick pony and their only way of, you know, finally dealing with things is uh, use of force or being super hardcore, then they don't have any business being in the profession at all because you have to be flexible enough to move from technique to a different tactic, uh, to uh, another direction, and change things up in order to find the thing that works. Uh, you can't just, you know, rely on, you know, you've got one go-to thing, and that's to give a direct order, and as soon as they don't get it, you dogpile. I mean, I've, I've seen guys that actually operated on that principle, and um, there's a time and a place for that. But it's not every single incident. It's not every uh, rattle out of the box. Um, and you just have to be better than that. Otherwise, what happens is, is how do you end up uh, treating, um, you know, your, your former peer now that you're over them? Well, you end up treating them like crap pretty much. I'll mute that. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure I wasn't off uh, track. It looks like we're getting some uh, absolutes on that. Uh, they agree. I mean, Alicia came and said how someone treats anyone gives us an idea of how they can treat anyone else. I think that's extremely powerful, spot on, maybe simplistic, but so truthful, uh, uh, really truthful uh, with that message. Very powerful, Alicia. I want to get everybody's thoughts on this. So I'll go Joe next. Joe, what's your thoughts, Joe? Have you ever, let me ask you a question, guys, and I'll, with Joe too. Joe, have you ever maybe seen an officer that was a bit of a fire starter and then maybe you found out they were on their way to make rank and, you know, kind of said, well, maybe I should talk to them because if they continue to be this way with the inmates, is there a good chance that that behavior could travel into that next rank? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and not only, not only that style of, of, of officer, you know, you try to pull them aside and let them know, you know, what you have up here on your collar <laughs> does not preclude you from an ass whooping. <laughs> I've seen captains, I've seen captains and majors beat down on a run because they thought what they had up here on this collar was going to, you know, gave them a, a Superman shirt underneath and, and, you know, they, they could do no wrong and, and not take an ass whooping. And uh, I remember one captain in particular found that out the, the hard way. Um, but you definitely got to pull them aside and let them know, you know, Hey, at some point, you know, the way you carry yourself and the way you, you the way you talk to these inmates are going to get you hurt and could get one of your coworkers hurt because he's pissed off at you, you know? And then, <laughs> you know, on the other side of the gamut, I've seen, you know, uh, one, one particular, uh, comes to mind. Not only, uh, was he scary towards the offender population, you know, he was mean to all his coworkers, and this dude winds up getting promoted to captain. Uh, yeah, and he was so scary for the offender population and, and so hard on the staff that, you know, myself and another officer were having a use of force on a convict who was high on K2. And not only did he walk up on the situation, he stepped over us and, con and continued to walk away from the situation, never offered any help. You know, so I've, I've seen both sides of that gamut. Um, you know, being hard when it's appropriate is one thing, but being hard all the time to the point where, you know, you start pissing off the offender population, you start pissing off your coworkers. At some point, that's going to come to a head and it's it's not going to end well for somebody. You know, it, the thing about, yes, the pen's mightier than the sword, but good verbal communication will gain you more respect down the road. The way you carry yourself, the way you treat the offender population, you know, if you treat them firm and fair, they, you know, respect will come automatically, especially if you're consistent in the way you, you, you deal with everybody. Um, you know, but that it, it's a dangerous game to play because not only are you, are you playing with your safety, you know, you potentially be playing with your, your coworker safety. And it may not be even on your shift. It may be the next shift. You go in there and start start shit and start fires. Next shift comes on, and that poor boss takes an ass whooping because you know half the convicts on that 
on that run are pissed off at you, but he just happens to be there, you know, and I've seen that too. You know, it's a dangerous game to play, you know, and I, and I hated, I hated fire starters, you know, and I would tell them and I would, I would just basically put it out in the, in the shift brief and don't go down there writing blank checks that your ass can't cash. If you can't cash it, don't talk it, let it be. You know, because at some point, like I said, it, it it's, it's going to become trouble either for somebody's personal safety or it's going to lead to something bigger. You know, uh, by the way, Joe, spot on. Everybody obviously agrees with what you're saying. Jason Healy, before I go to before I go to Butch on that, I want to mention something with Jason because he hit something that's really spot on. Uh, sometimes those that promote surprise, as I seen terrible sergeants become a pretty good white shirt more than once. So, guys, from the outside looking in, white shirt would obviously be the administrative side. Uh, so, basically, if I could generalize this, because not everybody's custody here, we do have some medical. So, basically, we're talking about maybe someone that's a frontline supervisor and then now moving themselves up to maybe higher executive staff. I mean, especially when you uh, move up to maybe uh, where your administrative side of things, let's just say that. But I, I learned something, guys. Um, I've always believed in teamwork, obviously. I, I don't think I'd be in the position. I am now because I think that people that are truly successful are truly defined by, uh, you know, how they're able to delegate and get people to want to work for them. I mean, I think that's the true definition of a boss that's successful. I mean, my boy Garen the other day said something so great. He knew he was successful when he called the unit as an administration and the, the officer he needed wasn't there. But as soon as the officer came back, he called him back. You know, I mean, trust me, when you're a, a supervisor that, you know, no one likes, uh, you know, they're not in a rush to call you back and, you know, you know, trust and believe they'll look to avoid you. But when you get your people, you know, not subordinates, followers, because, again, as a leader, you have followers, uh, you know, they want to be around you. They want to stay connected to you. I think that when you start to move up, you have to supervise, you have to supervise areas they don't have experience in. And that's really when you cross into the white shirts, because I'm going to tell you something is, is when you're departmentally growing and moving to the next position, obviously you're introduced to each level with the foundation that makes sense because it's from each level. So it's slow growth. When you're jumping into admin, you wind up having to oversee areas uh, that you've never had experience in rather rapidly. And you'll find out real quick. If you start pushing people aside, you'll find out how quick you're going to be an island by yourself because you can not manage areas that you have no experience in and expect to be effective if you don't have support from the people that are beneath you. And if I'm going to be in a high position, I'm not looking for subordinates. I'm looking for followers. I'm looking for people that believe in me because they know that together we're a team and ultimately we can be productive. And they, obviously they have to see you defending their needs. I mean, that, that's a big key, but yes, I believe uh, that shift does happen, especially when you get to the admin side, because there's so much there that's going to be ambiguous to you. And uh, if you want to try whatever method you did when you felt comfortable with what you were supervising, and now all of a sudden you're at this level where it's a whole different world, you better humble yourself real quick because at any moment uh, you're going to lose that ship 100%. Um, hey, Butch, I, I wanted to ask about that. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of talk about what we just discussed. I didn't mean to, you know, jump ship, but I was wondering if I can get your thoughts on, let me get you into, hold on one second. I want to know if you, if we can get your thoughts on what we were just discussing about running a unit and, you know, or, or how an officer or how a staff member treats an inmate and, you know, maybe, you know, a concern if they decide to move up. So again, in my position, I was made aware of, uh, on many occasions, uh, you know, not very uh, popular, but uh, not, you know, proud to say this about our profession, but, you know, there are many uh, a taxpayer dollars that went to uh, employees who were harassed by supervisors. And most of those conflicts, harassment cases, were the same, involved the same folks that uh, we got a lot of complaints from the inmates from. Um, uh, inmates, well, uh, I should say, a lot of the complaints that we were able to validate uh, and substantiate uh, were some of the same people that, you know, also got us in hot water administrations with, you know, with uh, personnel issues as well. So uh, I guess the question was, you know, uh, would you have a concern with, you know, if the way that you saw an employee treat an inmate, would you have a concern if they were then promoted 
to a supervisor, would you have a concern working for them? I'm, I'm going to tell you, I lived it and not proud to say it, but there's been a lot of taxpaying dollars that went out uh, for legitimate harassment and, and, and cases like that on the human resources side. So yeah, yeah, there is, uh, there is some of that. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, again, uh, Dave, just want to get your thoughts on this as well. Uh, you know, have you ever had, let's do it this way for you, Dave, because you're obviously on, on the front line. Have you ever found yourself in a position just in general where you felt maybe an officer was going a little too far, maybe a little too aggressive or, you know, maybe concerned that one day, okay, this, this, because you're a senior staff member, you know, mm -hmm. hey, this person is going to move up one day. And maybe if you're going to move up, these are certain things that you're going to have to change in order to be successful with us. Ah, uh, yep. I've seen people get promoted before that way. And usually what I do is just go talk to them. Uh, go ahead and have a conversation with them. Go, hey, I know you're this way in the units. Uh, tend to be pretty blunt when I talk to people like that, too. Say, hey, you're pretty hard on the units. What's What kind of plan do you have as a supervisor? What, what are you going to be doing? Um, it's pretty important that they start to take themselves out of that micro perspective and start to look at the bigger picture at that point though too that their actions if they're a fire starter are not going to affect just that unit that they were working in anymore it's going to affect the whole facility at that point if they're running the entire place like they would be at my workplace for instance so that really makes a big difference but they can't fix what they don't know about so somebody's got to talk to them about it they might not even realize that they're being that hard and I've seen some people wake up and actually become really good supervisors that way. Right. And then so I wanted to, I was blocking Joe's face with the uh, with the Tear Talk logo. Hey, Joe, look, I chose you over Tear Talk logo. So, mm -hmm. hey, so uh, great, great advice there, uh, Dave. Obviously, I just want to cross into this next part. I like what Russ said here real quick. Don't start fires. Put them out. Um, one more area of discussion I want to have and I want to make sure we get to it is. Uh, correctional management, uh, so supervisors from command staff all the way up to command staff, what can we do to make sure that we have our front line empowered to make sure that they're competent? Because, again, guys, I mean, we could give all this advice to the front line, but if the environment doesn't support their ability to be effective, to be confident, to carry out that directive or that authority, then the problem is we have a weak force. Uh, and the sad thing is, guys, uh, strong players in a weak environment will leave. Uh, that there's just no question about it. In corrections, we can't afford that. In, in corrections right now, we have to be more supportive than ever because uh, the people that can do other things that wind up here first, if we're not doing the right things to keep them, they're going to leave. I mean, and, and really, uh, a lot of us stay uh, because we love the family environment. That's the reason why most of us stay. I like to think that's the reason why most of us stay. So if we move away from that family environment, if we move away from showing that support, the good people that could have value are going to find no other reason to be in this profession. Cause I'm going to be honest with you guys. It's not about the money either. It's really about this connection. I think that connection can invite people in, but also more importantly can maintain them. Um, so with that said, um, I thought we could have just a quick round table real quick about what supervisors can do uh, from, you know, the immediate level, well, excuse me, all the way up to the command staff. Now I know for me, I'll start off with something first is you can't allow inmates to circumvent that immediate frontline level of authority. So everything that uh, you deal with as a supervisor from touring a unit to whatever it is, you know, you have to make sure that the inmates can't go to you for everything in an effort to circumvent that front line. Again, I, we used to say supervisors need to be visible, need to be approachable, but not so easily acceptable. Um, I'm sorry, uh, accessible. So again, approachable, visible, but not so easy, accessible. Now, with that said, guys, even if the frontline member makes a mistake, there's still a way that you could bring that person to you, correct them, not in front of the inmate, and then empower them to go ahead and correct whatever that interaction is uh, with the inmate. But you cannot allow that circumvent uh, that that inmate to circumvent. There's one thing I like that Texas does, um, and uh, and and he briefly, Joe said it before and part of his story, but I love this term now. I love how they call the unit officers bosses because even if the supervisor calls them a boss, even if the correctional management calls them a boss, look what that says. It says, yeah, I may run things up top. I get it, but this person runs the house. You know what's funny, guys? Let me share a joke with you real quick. Kind of reminds me of 
what Joe said when it comes to boss. So uh, a little quick joke, but it makes sense here because as I said, it, it's, I may run this facility, but Joe runs that runs this unit. And I want to, there was a three laundromats uh, that opened up on the same block that were actively competing against each other. So they said, you know what? We got to come up with signs uh, that show that we're better than the other two. So the first one comes up with a sign that says, hey, guys, we're the best laundromat on the planet, on Earth. So now the second one's like, holy crap, how are we going to beat that? They literally said they're the best laundromat on the Earth. We got to think of something better. Let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. Let's go bigger. Guys, check out this sign. Hey, guys, we're the best laundromat in the universe. Ooh. So then the third one's like, hey, guys. We're the best laundromat on the block. So, so the thing is, guys, being simplistic, letting the inmates know that, hey, I may run the house, but this person runs the unit. I love that word boss because to me it reinforces the fact that in the end, even though I'm here in management or I'm the sergeant, at the end of the day, your boss is going to be this officer here. Even when I come in, I'm saying, you know, Hey, guys, have you spoke to the officer? Have you talked to them? No, then you got to go back because we're not doing this. Because at the end of the day, the moment the supervisor or the correctional management allows that to happen, the Pandora box occurs. And at that point, that officer cannot run that unit because they know, uh, inmates know, hey, it's all right. I know Joe told me no, but Ganji's going to come down in 20 minutes and he's going to give me a yes. And now what happens to Joe? He becomes disenfranchised. So for me, as a supervisor, as correctional, ma correctional management, never allow an inmate to circumvent authority. Uh, what's your thoughts, Russ, when it comes to that perception of authority? What could we do better as supervisors or even at the higher level, correctional management? Uh, you know, one of the things that I used to constantly tell inmates in front of my officers, you know, when they would be coming over to try and run drama on me and do the, and do the end around and all of that stuff is, is the first thing I would ask the inmate was, is do you have permission to talk to me? And I put that onus, you know, right back on, that inmate having to deal with that officer in, in whichever part of the unit he was in, knowing that they had final authority. Uh, yeah, now naturally, you know, in the shadows and, you know, off to the side and stuff, I'm going to be doing the things that are necessary, you know, to keep the, the peace and comply with, uh, you know, orders and the laws and policy and all of that stuff. But I'm never going to let that inmate think that they can just end around and, you know, get a different answer for me that they can split staff and do all of that other stuff. Um, it used to, uh, you know, just peeve me to no end. We had some captains and even some um, associate wardens that had this so-called open door policy. And it drove me nuts because what it did was is it really frustrated the officers because they felt that their word was never going to be the final one. And it made it emboldened the inmates and put them in a position where they thought they could press the issue, sometimes even physically out there on the yards. So uh, that's the thing that we really want, um, you know, at our level is backing. And sometimes backing means that you're absent, that you're giving us free reign, that you are the one that is confident enough to either let us off the leash or, uh, or, you know, just give us the commands that we need silently, you know, from the, from the shadows, so to speak. So um, that's what I would ask of all of, you know, the managers and, and admins here is, you know, let us, you know, uh, do everything that we know how to do and uh, make sure that you don't shortcut us with regards to the inmates. Yeah, that, uh, yeah that's spot on, guys. Uh, again, back to that circumventing. And I also want to mention something, maybe Joe could explore this. If we have supervisors that are very isolated and they're communicating a message that is very different from each other, and they try to pass down that message for us to enforce uh, in a very isolated fashion to the point where we become confused, uh, then we become inconsistent, we become less confident, and our authority totally weakens because we have no idea what it is that we're doing it and why we're doing it. You know, I mean, that's the key. We, uh, I think for us... When you're a supervisor, correctional management, you have to have that end game in mind. And you have to make sure everybody's on the same page before it translates down to the front line, because the front line needs to know everything they do and how that relates to something bigger. And if we're inconsistent with that vision, then the front line 
you can't even empower them because they don't know into what parameters or where that task significance is. So again, inconsistency up top, isolated, individualized agendas. Like, I'm not, am I working for you or am I working for the agency? Because today I feel like I'm just working for you because you got something that you want. He got something they want. And, and I just don't know what it's expected of me at any point because everybody has something different. So I think consistency up top, uh, making sure we're not isolated, translate that consistency with some value and purpose to the front line. And that will build their confidence because not only do they have the what, uh, but as we talked about before, we empower the how, but we're also giving them a why behind why it's done, which will help them believe in the directors because they see the next level that's behind it. Uh, what's your thoughts on that consistency, Joe? And how important is that when it comes to uh, enforcing that perception of authority? Yeah, it's very important. I mean, if you have if you have four or five different supervisors and four different four or five different visions and four or five different perceptions, and nobody's on the same page, all you're doing is creating chaos amongst you know your frontline staff. Um, you know, a lot of the um, a lot of the units, you know, some of the the frontline uh, correctional officers see two sets of supervisors a shift. You know, especially if if uh, you know the the officers are doing 16 hour shifts or what have you, you know, you're, you're liable to see two different lieutenants and two different sergeants within that shift. And if they both, you know, don't have any consistency amongst each other, um, you know, you create confusion amongst the shifts because uh, they don't know what to do from, from one point to another. And, you know, that causes a lot of friction, a lot of problems. You know, when you have supervisors that isolate themselves and they don't get out and they communicate very well and they don't, you know, communicate the vision. Um, all you're doing is hurting yourself and you're hurting the morale of your staff. Uh, you're hurting their authority and you're ultimately, you know, you're making uh, making things harder for yourself than you need to. Um, you know, the chain of command thing was always one of my pet peeves. Um, and just like Russ, uh, you know, I, I had administrators with, you know, quote, quote, open door policies and, you know, it, it would burn my ass when a convict would go running up in the captain's office after, you know, my, my boss told him no, he went to my sergeant, my sergeant told him no, he came to me, I told him no. And then, you know, you do an end around and, 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 and go to the captain or hell, just directly go to the captain right off the bat. And, you know, that that captain or administrator caves in and, and gives the convict what he wants. You know, now you've done demeaned your frontline supervision and your boss. You know, so, you know, chain of command to me is very important. Um, you know, backing your staff is definitely important. Uh, you know, even when the when the boss is wrong. You know, like you said, you never correct a correct the staff member in front of the in front of an offender. You know, there's a way to save face in the situation right there at that point in time. But later on down the, you know, after after it's said and done, you pull that boss aside and say, "Hey, look, you know, really, this is what you should have done." Um, you know, I, it, yeah, it, it's just the way things are done now, and you know, most facilities and most administrators have this open door policy, which is fine. However, you know, uh, to me, I'm just an I'm old hand. You know, you went through the chain of command. You know, back in the day, it was unheard of for you to just go straight to a lieutenant. Most of the time, you never seen a lieutenant. The lieutenant only came down to your wing back then is when shit was breaking bad if you couldn't handle your job. And the sergeant couldn't, you know, couldn't put out the fire that you started. And then when the lieutenant got down there, you know, all hell was fixed to break loose because, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's just weird the way things are now with the open door policies. Um, you know, to me, chain of command is definitely important because, number one, you got to teach the frontline officer confidence and respectability to be able to carry out their own job and their mission on their duty post. Especially as a lieutenant, you know, I, whenever a call initially comes out on a radio, hey, we need a supervisor down here. Okay, Sarge, go down there and see what it is. Handle it. Let me know what you did. You know, you got the, I mean, you're building respect and you're building confidence, not only in your officer, but your frontline supervision. You know, that's how they get ready to take their next steps up. And if you don't do that, you're not doing yourself any justice and you're not doing them any justice. 
Yeah, you, you, you know, Joe, right off the bat, uh, I, I, I do believe, I want to mention something because I get what Joe's saying 100%. I, I, I believe in open door policy as long as it doesn't circumvent chain of command. So I, I want to have an open door where it allows people to talk to, you know, talk to us. I, I don't want to be so closed off because some people actually use chain of command just to cut themselves off from their front line. Like, like, you know, oh, did you go? It's like, dude, I just wanted to ask how you're doing. We have to know our people. Um, so I agree with you 100 percent. As long as you don't circumvent the front line. Sometimes I get people that are so paranoid. Uh, when you talk to their subordinates, um, the, oh, what, what are you guys talking about? It's like, well, we were talking about the Batman movie. Oh, hey, guys, stop. Because the last thing I, I want as uh, administration is to feel that uh, I cannot talk to the frontline people. You know, I, I want to talk to them. I, I, I want to get to know who they are. I, I want to, you know, I want them to know me. I don't want, you know, when I call somebody to office, I don't want them to dread coming to the office. I want to have an environment where they feel uh, psychologically safe, you know, and, and you can't do that unless we know each other and we know what to expect from each other. And, and that kind of crosses into the next thing, which maybe Butch can uh, definitely touch on this is that, you know, we as correctional management have to build a trusting environment. And now guys, I want you to hear what I'm going to say, uh, but don't overgeneralize it. Okay. Because again, there's, oh, you could always, find a way to negate what I'm saying, but I want us to be intentional with what I'm trying to say. Okay, guys, but hear me out. We want staff to trust us enough to take risk. Sometimes what I mean by risk is to go out of their comfort zone and try something new. Uh, I don't want my staff to be afraid to fail because at the end of the day, if they're afraid to fail, they start covering up their mistakes so then we really get never get to know who they are because at the end of the day is, oh, yeah, uh, you, you rule by fear. But, hey, guess what? Your facility is falling apart and you have no idea why because nobody nobody's talking to you because they're afraid. You, you, you think that's a good idea when instead of people telling you that they've done something wrong, they're hiding shit under the rug because you're ruling by position and, and not by relationship with the people you need. And, guys – you can still have a relationship with your people and the end result is still be productive. You know, there's an end game there. It's not saying I'm, I'm going to say have a relationship with your people and get walked all over. No, you have a relationship with the people in an effort to be productive. But having said that, if, if you're going to run by position and be and, and, and go quick to the pen with everything and, and write your staff up for stupid shit, they're never going to take chances. They're never going to take, you know, they're never going to look to grow. They're never going to take onus in that responsibility of authority. Mm -hmm. And also, if you try to micromanage them, they become reliant on you to make decisions. Because at the end of the day is you're on top of them every time they, they do something. So having said that, Butch, uh, again, just from your perspective, you at the highest level being like a deputy commissioner, which is guys... Uh, so again, how you have a structure is you have the departmental levels, then you have the people that run the facilities, but then you have people that would run a group of facilities considered like a, you know, you have a general manager of a store, then you have a regional manager, you know, a regional manager may cover more than one store. Same thing here. So, so Butch is at that higher level. And now, now, now Butch, if you ran, if you were a deputy commissioner at the high level and you decide that you're going to micromanage and not allow your people to grow because you're going to come at them every time they make a mistake. At the end of the day, what does that do to morale? What does that do for the growth of the facility if you yourself are putting a lid on everything that they do or try to accomplish? Uh, you, you hit it right on the head, Gang. I mean, if people are going to make mistakes, uh, sometimes, though, you know, we have it, – it's the deliberate mistakes where – you know, problems can start where it was you deliberately made the mistake. You knew it was a mistake, but you did it anyway, and you were hoping to get away with it. That's one thing as opposed to someone who, you know, took a risk and may, and it didn't pan out the way they wanted it to. Uh, th those are two different types of things where, you know, your subordinates may disagree with the philosophy or the direction you're getting or giving, and they just do the opposite of what you just said. That's different. Um, so that that is different. But they have to. You can't micromanage. No one can micromanage eight facilities. That's why we have superintendents and deputy superintendents. Um, you know, we we take the message from the commissioner, and then we pass it down to eight different wardens who pass it down to the deputy wardens, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but uh, so so you can't micromanage. People are going to make mistakes. I made mistakes. I learned so much from the mistakes that I made. And I also learned from a lot of mistakes that other people made. I didn't want to do the same things they did because I saw the outcome. So, uh, you know, if you're not making mistakes, sometimes you're probably not doing the right things uh, because corrections are so difficult. So you're always looking for a different way to get things done effectively. I, I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I did want to talk about the chain of command. I just, I, I did not tolerate breaking of the chain of command. And that was in both both cases with inmates and the staff um but that didn't mean that people i didn't know my people i didn't w walk around with a purpose just to meet people and to talk to people and to have them talk to me or if they th there's a way to use the chain of command as well if they talk to my immediate subordinate let's say i was a deputy warden and they talked to the director of security and they didn't get what they wanted or they didn't feel that their needs was met or they didn't get their answer, by all means, one of the first things I used to say is, hey, how's it going, John? Good. Hey, Butch, I got a question for you. And he would ask me a question, and I would say, what did the DOS say? Well, I didn't ask him. Well, why not? Well, because I'm asking you. Well, what are you asking me for if that's his area? Well, I just wanted to talk to you. I said, hey, listen, I appreciate it. Now, we could talk about basketball if you want. But, you know, I, I was a stickler. I, I didn't tolerate the – you know, people struggled with that with me. That was a big struggling point. I never made a round in a unit without the unit officer unless I had a different purpose. A lot of times I would make rounds because I was checking on public health violations or or, or, or some other maintenance issue that I wanted to follow up on to see if it was corrected or some type of security device that was installed I was taking a look at. But I never made a, just a general round without taking the officer with me so that when I was approached with an inmate by a question that related to the housing unit, I would just look at the inmate and then look at the officer. And it, it was part of the time. It was a time for the officer to either sink or swim or shine or, you know, if he knew what he was talking about, he answered it correctly. He or she answered it correctly. If he didn't, I'd wait till later and talk to the captain about it. But the chain of command to me for both staff and I never made a round in, in restrictive housing without without the staff and and I knew that they were doing their job because when I did you could hear a pin drop mm. you know I had the staff member that answered and knew every question that they were going to ask and they just wanted to see what I was going to say but I would you know I would always refer it to the expert and after a while you could hear a pin drop when I made rounds you know um and, and I learned that from some you know there were people modeling that for me and I, and I saw the effectiveness of it, but I, you know, it's chaos when there's no chain of command. It really is. I, I've seen some people that I really liked in the agency that uh, really had brought a lot to the agency, but chain of command was not their strong point. And let me tell you, it was chaos. I, I know people at some high levels were calling sergeants and units and, and it was just, a, it was shameful. Um, uh, and I and I used to see it with unit management and some, uh, so, you know, so, some of the some of the other side of the house where, you know, they would ask program questions and the director of class would be telling them something different from what the 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 uh, program officers were saying. And, it, it, you know, it was just it, it created chaos and it's very, very important. Now, people are uncomfortable with it a lot of times. You know, they wanted to hear what you had to say. I even, you know, I can remember the correction officer say, Butch, what do I got to come with? What are you, scared? Yeah, I'm scared. Come with me. You know, uh, they knew that I wasn't, but they, they would say it, you know, just to bust my chops a little bit. But, you know, that's my thing on, on chain of command. And, you know, uh, it's very, very important. But it's balance, uh, Gange. Like you said, you know, it's an open door policy. Yeah, I want people to be able to come in and say hello and, and, and if they have a real problem that, you know, some some folks are really, are really sharp and understand that, hey, I don't want to tell the captain this. This might have something to do with my wife or family. And I trust Butch to just to give him a heads up. I have a family issue now. Would I then refer them to the right people? Yes. Yes. But they some some of the folks just, uh, you know, they were comfortable. They knew me from when I was a correction officer and they and, and it wasn't operations related, I guess I should say. Uh, but yeah. I was, I, I you know, I, I did not tolerate breaking the chain of command with inmates or staff. I just didn't do it.
I was busy enough doing my job. I didn't want to do anybody else's. Yeah, you know, you said, uh, first off, we're all on the same page with that respect to that chain of command. And again, we, we didn't compare chain of command, open door policy. Both of them serve different purposes in my mind. Um, but, you know, single mom said something. I think it was single mom that was really spot on. Uh, as an ex-convict, believe me, the inmates can tell when the chain of command is broke. Um, you know, and I think that's powerful because that's really determined by what could be seen, which is our behaviors. You know, if, if we constantly allow the inmates to circumvent, uh, then how do you expect the officer to fully be able to run that unit or or whoever? I mean, I, we say officer because our backgrounds are officers, but guys, this could be applied across the park. Sure, you yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, 100 percent. I mean, that's where the magic is. I think Kinder's doing that now where she's from medical, but she sees. Um, the connection. Now, I like what she says here, too, if I could read it. If an officer has discomfort with speaking with certain higher ups and wants to pick and choose who they're comfortable with, that lends credence to the need for a career change. You know, I, I want to mention something, guys. We In my book, we talk about generalized animosity in, in the next book coming out. Um, generalized animosity is really it, it destroys the system. It's where we have a problem with one and then we generalize it out to the whole department as if you know, all of admin is bad all because I had a problem with Ganji and whatnot. And I, and I think to be honest with you, when it comes to uh, us trying to communicate our concerns, I do believe that, um, you know, I get that we may have that one person we want to talk to. I get it. You know, I do, but I would like to feel that as leaders, we're all willing to have that same outcome, that same want to help our people. Because at the end of the day, when someone needs help, uh, and real help. Guys, I'm not talking about someone misusing the system. So I want to yeah. get rid of the would have, should have. Let's just say someone that really needs help. I want them to be comfortable with going to the department that can help them the best. Not go to Dave because they know Dave. Not go to Joe because they go to they know Joe. I would love to them in a perfect world to feel comfortable knowing I can go to HR and they're going to help me regardless of who I speak to. Or I'm going to go to administration and you know, uh, speak to whoever in administration because I know they're going to help me because there are going to be times when Ganji's not at work, you know, and there's going to be times when Joe's not at work. And I would love to know that we are a representative of, of what's best in those departments. And I would love for people, I, I think I'm on, the, I'm definitely, I believe I'm on the same page with Kinder here is where I would love for people to see the department geared towards the best of those in that department instead of geared towards the negative of the department. So uh, let me just clarify that. And I know what I'm saying makes sense. I'm just kind of trying to feed off Kinder's thought, but think about this guys. If I'm frontline, right. And I have a problem, right. And let's say uh, I want to go to admin, but let's say Joe is good. I love Joe, but then you have Dave who I just can't get along with Dave. Dave's a problem. So the problem is that let's say there's multiple people that work there. I can either uh, generalize towards Joe, which gives the department the better, uh, the, the, the better, the benefit of the doubt, or it could be easier if I just generalize it towards Dave where everything's negative, And then I, I, I screw admin because, you know, they're not going to help me, uh, because, you know, Dave defines the rest of admin where I'm like, no, I, you know, why can't we gear towards the benefit of the doubt and say Joe is the true representation of what admin is, not Dave. Sorry, Dave. Uh, Joe, Joe is the true representation of admin. So therefore, a lot of us tend to gear towards the negative instead of really being intentional and saying, you know what? Uh, I, I, I know uh, even though Joe's not here, I know Joe is uh, definitely someone that uh, – does represent hopefully what the rest of admin would, would want to do in this situation. So therefore uh, I'd be more than willing to talk to Ganji if Joe's not here, that generalized animosity is a fuck, excuse my language. It is a killer because at the end of the day, it's like, Oh, admin sucks. Admin sucks. Admin sucks. And I get it. Sometimes we have those issues, but then when you ask somebody, they usually narrow it down to one person. And instead of holding that person accountable, you hold the whole department accountable to a point where even if that department is doing good things, you question it because you want to keep that negative bias towards that apartment. You know, me, me and I, I think Dave or, or was it Dave today? 
uh, I think it was Dave, right? When we were talking about, yeah, you could offer a turkey dinner, whatever it is. And, yeah. you know, yeah, the good intent don't matter because I have to have a negative mindset about admin or I have to have a negative mindset about medical. So even if there is good people in medical, I just want to stay convinced it's negative. So, you know, even if they're offering something good, I'm not buying it. But guys, if they offered you 10 things good, and you choose not to take any of it because you consider them the bad guy. Who's really at fault here? We have given you everything. You choose not to take it, but then we're still the bad guy, you know? And another thing about this too, kind of a little off topic, but remember guys, admin is not in control of every outcome. You know, all we could do is make the effort. And if you start judging admin by outcome, as opposed to effort, they just stop trying. And then you will get the admin who doesn't care because at the end of the day, no one has ever said to them, maybe to some extent, and guys, it goes both ways. Bear with me. Cause I do. Also, I also talk on front lines behalf as well, but just for this perspective, sometimes admin could use a thank you once in a while. And don't hate me for it, but hear me out. We do a lot of things that people may not see, but we're judged by outcomes that we're not in control of, you know? So it would be great once in a while for people to understand the effort behind an outcome that we did not get. You know, because the key is I don't want false promises. I want commitment. You know, if you could show me that you're committed to me, I don't care if I get the outcome I want. I trust that you're going to try. But if you could lie to me and give me false promises all day and, and I'm going to like that. No, I want commitment. And again, we also want the same going to the front line. I was just, you know, by the way, guys, everything's balanced in a perspective. But having said that, that the purpose of that last rant just now was to try to get rid of that generalized animosity. Guys, I have seen the best of both worlds. I have seen facilities where frontline and management and all departments are working together as one. And it's such a beautiful thing. And, and really guys, when that occurs, it's because they know how to hold individuals accountable as opposed to a whole department. And you just see this magic. And then you see other facilities that are divided because of one person, one person, and they'll divide everything because that person gets generalized to a whole department and everybody's upset and no one's being held accountable that that one person. So guys, don't allow that to happen. Be intentional. And if there is a concern, direct it to the person where the concern is, try to solve it. But the last thing you want to do is judge a department unfairly because you have the problem with um, one or two individuals. Hey, uh, Dave, you have anything about, uh, just before we get to a closing, about what you would expect from higher level management to help reinforce your position of authority when you're on the floor working with those inmates? I'm going to piggyback right off of Butch. Um, when the boss comes in the unit doing rounds, it, inmates always, never fails. They're always going to go up to them, hey, hey, boss, got to talk to you, got to talk to you. And if it's a good supervisor, they'll look at the inmate and go, hey, uh, have you talked to him yet? Unit deputy? No, uh, no. Well, you need to talk to him. Put in a request to him. We'll go from there. Uh, one of the quickest ways for a supervisor to gain respect in my eyes is follow that chain of command just like that. Uh, if the supervisor undermines me and if I told an inmate no about something that I know is going to stick and they make an exception and they go, well, Never mind, we'll let you do this anyway. You just undermine my authority for the unit. And what happens after that is every time I tell somebody no, they're like, I want the boss. I want him down here right now. So uh, support from supervisors goes a long, long way towards running a facility, I think, running units, running everything really smoothly. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm going to tell you something, guys. I mean, if you look at the different levels here, from frontline to deputy commissioner, um, you know, think about all the perspectives that you got in just one dialogue. And for people that want quick tip videos, first off, you wouldn't have the enjoyment of a long, uh, of a community like this with quick tip videos. You can't, I mean, it takes a while to get into a discussion and let it evolve into something worthwhile. And then in the end, we're all grown from it, you know, because again, we could just give out tips, but I think it's the discussion uh, that keeps on bringing us up to the next level because I, I kinder that her, her comment opened up to a whole nother uh, spot, even though it was a little off topic, it was definitely something that we crossed into that had value. So uh, again, thank you for that. And single mom, I would love to see if we can get her on one day. Love to get her perspective. She's truly supportive of what we do, but she has a different angle from us guys. And I think that angle could bring value to us because you know, it, it's great to see what both sides want. And in the end, you'll find that both sides pretty much want 
the same thing. Hey, uh, so just in closing, uh, Dave, Thin Line Media. Guys, real quick, uh, before we close, just again, uh, I have a, a book that's coming out in the market, hopefully by uh, 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 what's August 15th. Um, it's Lessons Learned While Working in a Prison, My Journey from Officer to Administration. Um, are you ready to take your correctional career to the next level? There's about 155 tips uh, in this book. Uh, some stories as well. We share a few stories, uh, some good endorsements, but we also have tons, a hundred and something, 55, whatever quotes from many hundreds of, of different professionals in the field, giving little nuggets uh, that could help anyone. Uh, even though you may find that my background is as an officer, guys, the uniqueness of it all is how you can apply what's being taught. It, 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 it's you know, guys, we do have a lot of similarities. Uh, so as I talk from experience, you can find a way to apply that into what you do. It's very universal, if you will, but it's going to talk about my growth and it's random tips. They're not written in any progressive order, but you know, they're there, they're there and they're complemented by quotes of other people from the profession who has also added um, their perspective. So when we give a perspective, it pretty much covers just enough. And then here's the cool part. We put behind every passage a line part of a journal so you can go ahead and document your thoughts. And then the end day is once you complete that whole book, you can give it off to somebody else when they start their career. When you're at the pinnacle of yours and when they're at their uh, their beginning, you can trade off and look at this. You know, things that we never had going in. It's such a great way to carry a legacy. Uh, so, so David and Sandy Hassan, who's doing the line editing, Thin Line Media, which is, uh, guys, if you want to write a book, uh, sorry, that's a little small. There it is. There's the page, www.thingraylinemedia.com. Uh, eventually, he's going to be busy, uh, especially when this book comes out and you see how it looks. So if you want to write something, definitely reach out to him now. He's very reasonable when it comes to his prices. And uh, if he believes enough in the book and it relates to what we do, I'll be more than happy to promote it as best I can on this platform uh, to share the message. So, again, hey, Dave, do you have anything you'd like to say in closing? First thing is, once his book comes out, make sure you get a copy of it, because I'm going to tell you right now, without giving away anything, this stuff is gold. You're not going to be sorry getting a copy of this book, regardless of the price point on it. I can assure you that. Thanks, Dave. It's a simple truth. It's just a simple truth. Uh, it's a book I would have to have when I first started off doing this work. It really is. Man, it that, that a means a lot of headaches. It means a lot to me, Dave. It really does. I appreciate that. Thank you for helping me get the legacy out there. I'm, I'm humbled. Thank you. My honor. Um, so, so, Dave, any closing thoughts, sir? Now it's about you, sir. <laughs> oh, closing thoughts. Went through a lot of stuff here tonight. Uh, I think you hit on, everybody hit on some good points talking about uh, management, supervisors, isolation, isolated supervisors. That happens with staff, too. Uh, it's important we don't let either side get isolated for that matter because that's how animosity towards administrative staff builds. Uh, talked about micromanagement here. Uh, in my book, micromanagement equals fear on the part of staff. If uh, they're being micromanaged, they're going to be afraid to make a decision for anything. And that's not the way you want the units to run. I wouldn't want it to run that way. And I couldn't imagine being an administrator and trying to... <laughs> Uh, micromanage an entire facility, that would be a nightmare. You know, if Butch would have done that, for instance, I don't think he would have retired. He'd still be there trying to write stuff out. It's okay. just not the way to go. <laughs> so all in all, it's this was awesome. Everybody, I, I always learn a lot from all you guys listening to everything, all the perspectives here. So it's good. Hey, I, I want to say, that, by the way, uh, I, I love what you said about micromanaging. I have a whole video on that. Um you know, we have people that micromanage one because uh, they can't let go of of uh, that area of expertise. They still want to be the best of it. Sometimes they get so concerned. They look for perfection when people are going to have different ways of doing things. Your your objective is, yes, delegate the what, but at a higher level, you, you push down the, the how. Um, and you're right. Most of the time, micromanagement is out of fear. Now, Julie may be the only person who may not work in corrections, but... I think me and Dave will, will, if she wants to write a book, Dave, we have to, we have to help her, Dave. Oh, yes. Because that's Julie from Canada, Dave. 
Okay, good. I mean, so Julie, if you have something, you have our word, we'll work with you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we would be honored uh, to share whatever thoughts you have. And uh, before I get to uh, Butch, I wanted to say for to be kinder than necessary. Uh, I, I think the journal idea is important because uh, even doing this show, we learn a lot from each other. Uh, and I don't think I know it all. I don't think the people that are in it know it all. So I think what makes the book really good is if I start the journey to give people the talking points, like I've always done on Tear Talk here, and then to get the best out of them so when they could share their story to the next generation, we hold true to whatever core values that we don't want to lose. Because right now, guys, as the system is changing, and I hate saying the change because I like to say evolve because I like to believe we're growing based on past successes and failures as opposed to, lead to, as opposed to just change, which more is, uh, to me, pressured from external, um, you know, external forces. Uh, again, I don't even use the word transform. I use the word cultivate because I want people to feel that they're a part of what's happening. I think the journal matters because it's a way to cultivate people and to, to continue those core values because I don't want to lose them. Believe it or not, guys, the people that we have on this panel right now, the people that have been on Tear Talk for however many years, we teach core values. That hasn't changed. You know, if anything, we've evolved based on those core values. So my concern is that people get so frustrated with this profession that they just leave. And when they leave, they take the core values with them. So let's hold on to them. Let's have this book. Let's make sure the book is centered on core values that we believe in. And then we can evolve from that foundation. And that's the importance of, of why the journal is needed to not just keep our legacy, uh, but to really do our best to hold on to what makes this profession work, which is really family, loyalty, integrity, I mean, the list goes on. That's pretty much the center of this book. And I will tell you something right now. That book has evolved from dialogue and, and evaluated experience from the course of 20 years. I can't think of anything that has not been covered in that book to some extent. Uh, that is truly every page is an aha moment. There's nothing simplistic in uh, what's being said on those pages because they come from the other end of exhausted dialogues on why we do what we do. Not just the how, not just the what but the why and the why comes from knowledge I've gained from the people that have done it, that I've been blessed to learn from and then put it on the pages. The book itself is about 509 pages, but mind you um, it's over a hundred thousand words or around there, but a portion of it is the journals that we allow so we could spread on. So if it's, if it's a hundred thousand words now, by the time you give it to somebody else, which is the hardest thing to do, but that's the importance of it. If you put effort, really hard effort into it, the harder it is to give away, is, is why you need to give it away. If it's too easy for you to give it away, then go back and redo it. I want this book to be so hard for you to give away that that's how much value it has. I want this to be the hardest thing you have to do is to commit all this work to this book and then just give it away. So remember, when you give it away, you're at the pinnacle of your career and you're going to give it away to someone who's just starting who can have the most value towards it. Hey, um, hey Butch, anything you'd like to say in closing, sir? No, just want to thank you for the opportunity. Uh, again, I thought the dialogue was fantastic. I I, I truly mean this uh, to all of the uh, folks participating. Is I have this feeling that I learn more than I teach. Uh, every time I'm on one of these things, uh, I, I hear something that was fantastic, and I wish I had, you know, heard uh, the way that I was articulated when I was still working, so that I could use it to my advantage. Uh, Russ floors me with some of the stuff he comes up with. I wish I, I had heard some of that stuff uh, while I was working. I would use it because it's just it just it just shortens the explanation and gets right to the point. But uh, no, I enjoy, I enjoy it. I, I learn from everyone. There is one final uh, message. I just want to make sure that when folks understand that you know people are asking you to figure out the how, that you understand that there's parameters. I want you to understand that. There's a reason for parameters, and I want you to understand what the parameters are. So, yeah, we'll give you the, the leeway to figure out how to get things done, but it has to be done within those parameters that are outlined in policy. Yeah, I just want to say uh, that was uh, B. Kinder said, I will certainly know many officers have an excellent recommendation coming their way. And can I also mention, first off, that you freaking rock, Kinder, but I want to mention something to everybody here because uh, Alicia um, – even though we don't get a chance to chat because I'm trying to wrap up the book, but I really got to try to find time to call her. Um, she has been so supportive uh, since day one, and she has taught me ways to 
uh, really have value for what I do at a higher level because she has found ways to apply um, what we teach here uh, to just real world application, which makes it add to the value of what we do. So I wanted uh, kind of to realize that this really, even though it comes from the background of an officer, I promise you, as I've grown in the profession, there'll be things there. I guarantee you that could apply. I mean, I have a, in the book, it's something I even have how custody could work better with medical. You know, there's a whole section on that, uh, you know, basically talking about the shifting of priorities and, you know, what we need to do to understand each other's role. I even have things like a thank you board, the importance of thanking each other and, 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 and the difference between recognition and appreciation, you know, how we need to not just look to recognize people for extraordinary things, but appreciate them from the inside for what they do, because eventually quantity becomes quality and you can't ignore someone uh, okay, you know, okay, this person saved a life. That's great. Let's recognize them. Uh, but, but this person done a thousand tours. Yeah, but that's rather routine. They've done a thousand tours. There's task significance behind everything we do every day, no matter how routine it is, because the sad thing is guys, and I'm going to tell you something, the truth, this is the hundred percent truth. The only time the routine ever gets noticed is when it's not done. And that's fucking despicable. It's despicable. Recognize the milestones and you'll find people start to appreciate the routine, you know? So to me, that matters. Hey, uh, Joe, Joe Papano. Hey, Joe, you have anything you want to say in closing? Yeah, definitely. I, I appreciate everybody that was on tonight because I, I, you got perspectives from all over the place, you know, and, and it's awesome because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, no matter what kind of facility you're on, you got to have interdepartmental uh, operability with each other. You got to have that harmony with each other because, you know, the, the main scope and the main objective is for us, all of us, regarding what department, regardless of what department we're in, you know, to walk out the same way we walked in. Uh, you know, your frontline officers, uh, all your correctional officers that may be watching, you know, take the initiative. Don't be afraid to make a mistake um, as part of the learning blocks. You know, that's, 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 that's how you gain experience. You know, mean what you say, say what you mean, you know, frontline supervision, back your staff, give them the latitude to fall on their ass and make their mistakes, pick them up, dust them off, show them the right way. That's your, this is your golden opportunity to teach. It's your golden opportunity to, to, to lend them some of your experience and your wisdom and, you know, help them out in the long run, gain an experience. You know, and I can tell you, I, 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 even as a lieutenant, I've seen both the administrative side, I've seen the correctional officer side. And there are a lot of things that the correctional officers don't see that administration sees behind the scenes every day. And I'm sure uh, Butch and, and, and Anthony both can, can attest to, you know, the thousands of mama calls that they get in a year's period over, you know, uh, you know, offender complaints, you know, officer so-and-so did this, officer so-and-so did that. And they never once make a mention to that officer because, you know, administration's administration's job is to shield the people underneath them. And it's our job to shield the administration from the people underneath us. Mm. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, uh, you know, officers got to just keep fighting the fight. You know, don't be afraid to don't be afraid to make a mistake because if you're afraid to make a mistake. You're in the wrong business. You're going to make a mistake. It's not a matter of if it's a matter of when stick with it. Um you know, and like I said, the, the supervisors, make sure you back your staff. Let them make, give them the latitude to, to run their area. Give them the latitude to fall on their ass and make their mistakes. That's where you pick them up, dust them off, and that's where you, you help them gain their experience and knowledge. Um, you know, having harmony between the frontline staff and, you know, even even all your, your different departments, medical, education, you know, it, it's a must because, like I said, the grand scheme of things, you're all one big team behind the behind that gate, and you need each other, no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah, that that uh, Joe. First off, thank you because that that's basically what we do here. We try to unite. I mean, I want people to look forward to going to work on Monday, and the best way to look forward to is is to look forward to the people you're going to connect with. I mean, yes, we still have a job to do, but sometimes when you do the job with the right people, it doesn't feel like work. I mean, that that's the key. It would be great to go to work, get the job done, but kind of feel like there's a family. And at the end of the day, we're all supporting each other. Hey, hey, Dave, just real quick uh, before I get to Russ's closing thought. Um, real quick, can you say your book and how people can get it? Because you have a lot of requests for it real quick. 
Ah, the name of the book is Norse Germanic Runes and Symbols. Pull the copy of it up right here because I always have many of these laying around. Uh, you would be able to find it on Amazon. Norse Germanic Runes and Symbols is a field reference guide specifically for law enforcement and corrections. And it's a pretty handy resource. It's been used by a lot of different places. Uh, there's some copies going out to the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, a lot of different places have these. It's all over the country. It's over in the UK. So definitely it's on, it's on Amazon. Go ahead and find it. And if you have any questions, reach out to me through my website. I'm always happy to help. Thank you, Dave. And and be kinder real quick. If you want to email me some stuff and if you want to come on, just tell me what topic you like to talk about and we'll have you as part of our panel discussion. Uh, you know, basically we just have fun. We chat and we, and we show, we all share into a level of, I like to call it developed dialogue. I'd be honored to have you. It says that you uh, talk about PTSD. I think that's a worthy topic. Uh, so if you would love to come on one day, just please email me and then I'm sure I'll, I'll guarantee you Everybody here would probably love to see that. And I'd also love to see single mom uh, come in and share that perspective. I believe she's someone we can trust on this venue. Uh, she's very supportive of us. And I like the fact that she's been on the other side. And I think there's a way she could find a way to bridge that gap. I mean, look at single mom. Love all of you. She's been respectful since we've been here and we've been respectful to her. I would love to maybe find a way to share dialogue with her and, you know, see if we could discover some middle ground here. And I think she'd be a great person to do that with and uh russ gotta have your closing thoughts russ bring us to school man as, as as butch said bring us to school i'm 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 a little bit just like you know over overwhelmed right now because there's a lot of great things in there you know um everything that we touched on tonight uh you know really just you know would spark off you know one memory after another to mine and you know giving me ideas for you know uh future things to say future things to write um, you know, sometimes just having to be uh, amongst the best of the best uh, really causes you to be able to look back at your career and remember some of the stuff that, you know, you thought you forgot so many ages ago. And so, you know, just uh, each and every one of these guys, uh, man, I think that we were hitting on all cylinders tonight. I think this is a, a great, great roundtable. Um, I want to mention one real quick thing about uh, Dave, though. And having that book, you know, available at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. If you guys don't know this, it was Simon Wiesenthal that caught Adolf Eichmann. So I think that that's a, I think that's a, you know, a fantastic testament. If uh, if they're if they're using his book for some of that there, uh, but uh, each and every one of you guys is is an expert in your own right, and um, I'm honored to have been uh, on the panel once again. And then just getting back to our original uh, subject matter again about about your authority, right? Uh, each and every one of you out there that is doing this job right now, no matter what level it's at, um, fulfill the authority that you have. Uh, your statutory authority is what I'm mostly talking about here uh, to the greatest degree that you can. You know, you can grow into it um, and, you know, fill in every single border of that or you can just kind of you know muddle through your whole career and uh never really be an impact player and never really make a difference uh the choice is up to you take that mantle on though and grow into it to the highest degree that you possibly can and uh i think that uh everyone here is capable of being that impact player i love that the impact player i love that Hey, guys, I want to say uh, Julie also does dispatch, so I want to thank her for her service as well. She said things have been brutal in the career lately. Uh, obviously, your hard work does not go unnoticed. Consider us all a friend. You know, if you ever want to vent or, you know, whatever it is, if we can help, um, you know, definitely. I would, I, even if you want, maybe we could do a show on dispatch. Maybe we could find somebody to bring them on. And let's talk about the, the job and, and what you go through. Um, and as for kinder and single mom, yeah, if we want to all get together and do that, Sean PTSD from the other side, uh, I, you know, with single mom, I would love that. I mean, again, this is how we, we grow. Uh, you need to have a call in night sometime. Uh, that's Patty. We all love Patty. Uh, Hey, Hey guys. So, uh, just want to say something guys. So again, just kind of related to the topic, you know, uh, your perception of authority really, uh, is not based on your position. It's based on you. I think overall, that's what it is. And what we need to do, even as a management level, is do whatever we can to reinforce 
um, that person's perception of authority by, you know, making sure we don't allow anybody to circumvent that chain of command. I think that's key because once you open up that door, guys, I'm telling you something right now. No one could be effective if you as a supervisor are allowing the inmates to come directly to you. You can't expect me as a frontline person to be able to do my job if the inmates can always go around me when I tell them a no. So eventually what's going to happen is, guys, is people just stop doing their job. And then when you go in and you see the unit running amok, what can you do? You can't run every unit, but you caused it. Now, you'll go ahead and try to blame the officer or try to blame the frontline person. But in the end, every time that frontline person said no and you were saying yes, this is the end result. Mm -hmm. It's a unit that has no control because no one's making the effort anymore. Whatever you do, try to never never negate the effort of an officer trying to maintain control or the or someone from the front line trying to maintain control if you negate or minimize their effort then don't get mad when in the end the unit's out of control and one last thing guys when you walk into a unit as a supervisor and you de do see a unit out of control first thing you do is step back and ask yourself is there something i could do more to reinforce this person's level of authority is there some way i can support this person before we go into this you know, CYA mode or just yelling at the person. Cause sometimes guys, people just need a nudge and need to know that they're supported and you'll find that they'll transition real quick. But again, if we don't show them support, if we don't balance that weakness and we go quick to yell them, we ain't doing anything constructive. We're just destroying the person's morale. And in the end, uh, they're going to have no confidence because how do you become confident with that authority? If you've just been belittled. I mean, I mean what, what, what a conflict that is. As always, guys, the show is tipped up. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe.